Real quick, before we start this podcast episode, I just want to say thank you for tuning into the Mark Olson Podcast. I know you've got a million things that you could be doing right now, and the fact that you're taking time out of your day to watch this podcast episode truly means the world to me, and I just want to say thank you for that. If you'd like to continue to support the podcast, right below this video, if you could hit the subscribe button, and then, hey, if you got some more time and you want to hit the download button, the comment button, the like button, the share button, any of those buttons, it's greatly, greatly appreciated. It helps for other people to find out about the podcast, and it helps for you to be notified about future episodes. So if you guys could take a quick second, hit the subscribe button, I would really appreciate that. Outside of that, this episode and every other episode is brought to you guys by Roast Umber Coffee. As some of you guys know, I co-founded Roast Umber Coffee, and we have the greatest farmers in Guatemala and Honduras and the greatest roaster in Grand Rapids, Michigan, all to bring you guys the greatest cup of coffee possible. So if you'd like to try it out, go to our website, use the coupon code MARK30, and you're going to get 30% off your coffee. Now on to the episode. Thank you guys again for tuning in. So when do you decide, okay, you know, now is the time to pull the trigger, drop season three, and, you know, let the chips fall as they may? When all the stars align, and it feels like those stars are aligning right now, and so we're going to drop it on August 9th. August 9th. Let's go. Let's fucking go. Let's go. And just like that, guys, it's official. Season 3 is officially launching on August 9th, and I promise you, it's actually launching on August 9th. Now, with that, before we get into this podcast episode, I want to give you guys an idea of what to expect with this podcast episode. We don't get into the nitty-gritty of what to expect on August 9th. You just got to be here on August 9th for that, okay? So instead, what we get into is the mindset of the team and what led to the decisions that they made that led to Season 3. So we get into all of that. We get into some of the history of D-Gods. We get into what to expect further down the road. And of course, Frank's not going to come on the podcast and not drop Alpha. So with that, I'm done talking. Let's get into the rest of the episode. Season 3, August 9th. Let's go. Welcome to the Mark Colson Podcast. First off. Happy to have you here. This is this has been something I've been looking forward to for a while because we've been we've we've had times that we talked about recording a podcast, like when you got docs for the first time. We did actually record a podcast right before Utes release, but we didn't end up putting that one out. And so it has been a long time coming. Frank, welcome back to the podcast. How's it going, bro? Thank you, man. Um, yeah, it's been a fucking crazy, uh, crazy journey so far. Feels like. Uh, Feels like we're on the eve of something, you know, even bigger now. So pretty excited. Oh, we'll get into all of that. But yeah. uh, but first, I got to ask you, how does it feel to do the first podcast back with me fully docs this time? Let's go. It's crazy because I think we were just talking about it. I can't imagine doing a podcast in a mask at this point or even wearing a mask. So it's just wild to me that I spent a whole year um, anonymous, you know, running this project, going going around wearing that Bitcoin mask. Um, it feels like a lifetime ago, to be honest. I, I can't even imagine it now. Dude, it really it really does. Like, it's crazy to think about, like, the first podcast, doing, running that in February 2022, and then how much has changed since then. It, it's been wild. So if anybody hasn't watched those podcast episodes, by the way, if you're if you're an ETH person, you're kind of new to these podcasts, you should definitely go back and, and watch the first two episodes that Frank and I have done. It's kind of cool to just see how the, how the whole project has grown since then. Um, and just, I mean, D-Gods has completely changed. The first time you came on, we were 12 soul. <laughs> crazy and i remember i was uh skeptical of even going on the pod at the time i think it was the first one i ever did and yeah i just it didn't click to me that you know it made that we that i needed to do um or i should be doing podcasts and like kind of talking about what's going to come out and obviously you know learning on the field that was one of the most impactful things that happened in the history of the project so thank you so much for making that happen and kind of forcing me to do it I'm, I'm really glad. Kind of put us on a whole different trajectory. Oh, dude, the feeling is mutual. I never thought I'd be I'd be doing a podcast talking about JPEGs for a living, but here we are. So I don't think my parents had that on their uh, bingo card for their son. But hey, you know, it is. What I would be is. shocked if they did. That would be really impressive. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's where I want to kind of begin the podcast. The last time we did this podcast, obviously you weren't docs. And so we never really got into your background and kind of like what you thought you were actually going to be doing with your life versus what you're actually doing now. So let's start off. You went to UCLA, right? Yeah. Okay. So when you were at UCLA, like, what did you think you were going to be doing for a living and like kind of walk me through, how did you end up getting into entrepreneurship and startups and all of that? Yeah. It's funny. Um, I feel like my whole life has been this, uh, zoom. Like uh, once I started kind of hustling it never really stopped. And so even when I was in high school, I was just working underground on all these film sets, got into UCLA on like a full ride, was there at UCLA, was just hustling. And, uh, my friends and I started like an ad business from that transition into like this delivery business. 
And um, it kind of really started to take off when we started this delivery business called Duffel. And at the time, I knew very little about startups, to be honest. Um, I was a film, film major, and my friends and I just started do doing these deliveries on scooters, just trying to make money, literally just delivering whatever people wanted. Um, and we made a really janky website. And I found out about this thing called Y Combinator. And the way I found out about it was this guy, Paul Graham. He has all these blogs on the internet that genuinely changed my life and reading the way that he was thinking about things, startup equals growth and starting to understand how cool it was the idea of making something um, that, that starts out really, really small and can get a lot bigger. And so we applied to Y Combinator. I didn't think we'd get in. We, yeah, we ended up, uh, yeah, we ended up applying and got, and got in and that was pretty incredible. And that's when I dropped out of UCLA. Um, continue to run that business for a year. We had five co-founders at the time. And, uh, you know, it was just felt like David, who now runs the company, just had it under control. And so um, I, I left at that time. Right after that, I got into a coding boot camp because I was like, I don't want to slow down just because I left the startup. So I start, I hit this coding boot camp because I always felt like I wanted to be technical. I knew I wanted to work in tech at this point for the rest of my life. And I felt insecure that I didn't have probably one of the most important skill sets that you need to have uh, in the industry. So I started doing this coding bootcamp and before it even finished, like a week before, I was already on Twitter, making the rounds on startup Twitter. And uh, I, I had a tweet that went viral of a funny cold email that I wrote. And a few companies that hit me up and wanted to hire me to do growth, growth engineering. And one of the ones was called Main Street. And I basically went uh, and, and I took the job in Main Street and I continued to work there and uh, for, for about a year. And in that time, I had a few other websites also go viral because I was always just kind of hustling, trying to you know, do something crazy. And so I had this one that was kind of crazy called Bitcoin or shit because um, <laughs> I was getting really into Bitcoin at the time and it's called Bitcoin or shit. And that one popped off and then I started just doing side jobs. So it got to a point where I was working like four or five jobs at the same time, you know, classic COVID and everyone was quarantined. I was just working as many as many jobs as I could. Um, because I just didn't know how else to fill my time. And I felt like I just wanted to do something that, um, was really, really cool. And when I was working those four to five jobs, my friends and I were also just trying to like find a side hustle to act so I could quit all those jobs. And so we had like a, a coffee company that we were trying to make get off the ground. We had a, uh, <laughs> you know, we had like a weird stock trading type app thing idea that never, you know, not, never even got to like production. And, uh, and then you know, we started asking ourselves, like, hey, I think we have a kind of good squad here to do NFTs. Like, you know, I can handle the marketing and maybe some of the development. And a few of the other guys just had different kind of skill sets. Johnny, who is the lead singer of a band uh, when we did this, he just happened to be one of the fucking best uh, artists, you know, that, that I, to this day I've ever met. And yeah, we just uh, we, we saw an opportunity on Soul at the time and we were just getting really excited and within the first week uh, well I think D gods we had the idea for the project and then we did the first pre-sale mint all in the span of literally uh two and a half three weeks and so you can just tell me Pope pre D gods was just one of those classic hustle grind set always making moves always uh um you know just trying to do cool things with my friends and I feel very lucky, knock on wood, um, that I get to still work with those guys to this day. And obviously, it's gotten a little bigger. Dude, yeah. it, it really is cool. Like, any, every time there's one of those threads that goes viral about, like, your, you, you know, how you got started and all the guys that you were working with and how many of them you're still working with now, dude, that might be, like, Every time I see that, I smile because I think about like my buddies who I grew up with and the guys that I still talk with every day. And it's like, man, it just there's nothing cooler than like building something with the people that like know you the best. Because, you know, there, there's so many times people start businesses with somebody they don't really know. And it's like businesses are so personal in so many ways. And like you have to know how to like work with each other and, and really bring out the best within each other. And like the fact that all of you guys have been working together for so long and have been friends for so long, like, dude, that's just, the, that's the cool shit. Like, I just got to say that, like, I, I fucking love that. So I honestly don't know. I don't know how to work without my friends. I'm at a point where everything I've done in my life has been, uh, cause I, for me, hanging out is kind of like never been in my vocabulary and it sounds so cringe to say, but I find like the most stimulating conversation, the most fun that I can have is always been talking to the people in my life about fucking scheming and making moves and, and doing something cool. And um, man, I'm just lucky this, this is working out because I don't know if I know how to operate in any other way 
Um, so yeah, I, I don't even, it, it's crazy. It, it's always been a dream and the fact that we can keep this, um, the fact that this continues to grow and it feels like this is a winning formula. I mean, I feel like the luckiest kid in the world. There we go. There we go. So, okay. I want to talk about where your brain was at, at the beginning of October, 2021, right? When you decide to start D gods, right. And what people thought of an NFT project back then has completely changed basically two years later, right? Like yeah. it's the whole space has changed. There really wasn't, I don't know. It, it's like the space was like, or it was kind of like the wild, wild west back then, right? Like you could essentially rug a project if you wanted to, you could mint out the next day, just delete the discord. And there was really no way to even get tracked back then. There was like, even if you did actually launch the project and put out the NFTs, like you could, you know, utility was this kind of like, idea that nobody actually knew like what should people really do like there was just really no there was nothing that you had to do it, you just you could literally do anything and so at that time what did you guys actually want to do with d gods and kind of how has it played out a little bit differently than what you initially expected at the time i'm i'm not gonna lie we we had an irrational confidence that uh, <laughs> that <laughs> we've been humbled many many times but at the time we just thought okay Everyone else is kind of doing this basic thing. It's like the animal adjective NFT. Like, let's do something different. And that's when we landed on on gods. We're like, okay, what's better than a fucking god? Um, yeah, I mean, what's better than animals? A fucking god. And then we kept, then we, I remember, I'll never forget to this day, looking at the D gods domain at $5 and just feeling like, holy fuck. Like, <laughs> yeah, just seeing it on Namecheap. And then we just swept all the domains at that time. But I think the thought process was not too nuanced, if I'm being honest, when we first started. Um, we had an idea of this paper hand bitch tax. And that idea was kind of in this, hey, everyone's doing this kind of basic thing. Let's try to figure out what is, what do people really want? What's that gooey center of what people really want? And at the time, it just felt like people were just annoyed at fucking paper hands. And so it was very basic. But then we have this tendency, and even to this day, it, it stays with this team, of trying to like over like go so above and beyond what is required um just because we feel like this insecurity like hey we we don't know what we're doing maybe there's these experts that know way more about nfts than us which is over time played out you know not to be too, totally true not and not most people don't really know what's what's going on and uh yeah we, we wanted to make something that felt different and so the website was even like kind of a meme and play on it was a commentary on all the other NFTs coming out at the time because every NFT had the same roadmap. It was IRL events, you know, web bridging web three to web two. It was uh, merch. And then it was, um, it was like, yeah, it was like that kind of thing. And so our website was a parody of that in a lot of ways. We had like shitty red bubble merch, dinner at Applebee's, um, you know, that was the kind of line items on, on our roadmap. And it was just kind of a commentary even, which I think now is ahead of its time that like roadmaps are stupid. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was kind of the thought process going to the mint. And then after the mint, you know, I don't know if I've talked about this too publicly or in this official of a capacity. Um, dude, it was, it was, uh, it was, t it was brutal, man. Like, uh, because we're good guys. Like, you know, me, me and the, me and the guys that, that started this project, we, we wanted to make a cool NFT project, but we didn't want people to like lose money. We didn't want people to um, have a horrible experience or do something that was fucked up. And so when the mint happened, we had this thing where we wanted to make a custom marketplace to enforce this paper hand bitch tax. And honestly, like we were just, in, we just were incompetent. We weren't capable to do it. And this is so early on Solana when there wasn't even like good documentation on market. This is pre Magic Eden, you know, pre like any of the major market, definitely pre Tensor, pre all of this stuff. And um, yeah, we just were not able to make this marketplace. And I felt like we all felt so bad that we just didn't touch, you know, the, the, the money. Like we were just like, man, I'm just going to leave it in here because on the worst case scenario, let's just return it. And, um, and then it started this like four or five month period where now I casually kind of go over it in most interviews because nobody gives a fuck. Um, but I go over it and like, oh, we were just like fucking up or whatever. But I'd argue like there was that period of time we were working the hardest in a lot of ways, just trying to figure out how to make this fucking community happy because it was clear internally that the paper hand bitch tax was not having like the desired effect. And uh, on top of that, we launched you know, the, the first version of like a blogging tool on Solana where, you know, you could tip the creators. We try to get all these creators in, in on that. And then we try to build our own private Reddit forum and, uh, it called like uh, D palace. 
and the idea was okay it's token gated reddit now people can discuss different ideas or whatever and now i look back on it i'm like it was so silly because who gave a fuck about any of that stuff but when i get shit for telling you know talking about nfts and why people don't necessarily care about utility it, it comes from a place of uh you know trauma for me like i felt like man no matter how hard we worked on this software no matter how hard we worked on this tooling you know nobody actually cared even when we did deliver it and honestly when we did deliver it you know floor would go down people would be upset there's nothing crazy about it and so you know that was what forced us to just take a totally different approach and my line that i always say to this is when we launched dgods i always felt like uh you know the community the whole community thing with nfts was bullshit but over those four or five months, I realized it's all bullshit except for the community. And this little thing that we did called D-Gods Week, um, in, be in between us launching this utility and these software tools or whatever, um, you know, that ended up being magical. Like Aussie, one of the guys in the community, skydive, people got tattoos, people had pictures and videos of their family, and all of this was around this like D-Gods Week. And um, now I look back at it and I'm like, wow, it's almost, it's almost poetry that the thing that we did as filler, the thing that we did to fill in time in between the launches ended up being the thing that solidified this community and obviously is what allowed us to grow to the degree that we, we have today. So um, that's how I categorized the early days of D-Gods was a lot of fucking around and a lot of finding out. Yeah, I mean, it really was. Like D-God week was one of those things where all of a sudden you just saw all this like really unique talent, like all the people that we had in the community who were doing all these like very different cool things to like kind of... You know, I think one of them was like, do something nice for like your mom. And it was like, that's so wholesome. Like that was cool to see on the timeline, like in a, in a, in a time where like the world was so divisive, like all of a sudden we had all these people who were just doing kind things. Right. And I was like, that was cool to see. Right. Then we had people like Aussie who were jumping and skydiving and then shortly after D God week, all of a sudden, like I remember JB started doing the shoeys and like shoeys played such a major role in like kind of getting the community like sewed together it was yeah. it, like even something as dumb as shoeys right yeah. it's like when you think about it right because that became kind of like what we were known for for a second of like oh it's a bunch of frat guys who do who do shoeys right but i think yeah i mean and you're even skipping a part where i think um obviously the shoeys are sick and you know the, the all-time high shoeys do hit different uh no i think there was there was a moment and you, people can go back and find these tweets where it was december so we minted in october and it was december and at this point, there had been, I think, a week in between a D God selling. Like, you know, it was just dead. Like, the Discord was just a group of like 15, 20 people at that time, um, just kind of shitting on me um, over and over again. And I have all these tweets at that time where I'm telling people, like, hey, guys, I, I think we're figuring this thing out. Um, don't give up on us. Like, I know if you're leaving now, like, we're going to figure this out. We're not giving up. And um, at a time, it kind of went on deaf ears. Some people heard it, some people listened. But I, I think back to that, that moment, and I think about where we're at today. You know, we're getting close to launching something we've been working on now for, for five, six months. And I feel like if I could say something to the community, it's just that we're always learning, you know? And I think we have a track record of when I say that, hey, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fail. Like we're not gonna flop. And even if we do, we're, we're, we're learning at a very rapid rate and, and making sure that we're not ever sniffing our own farts or, um, being out of touch. And so I feel like there's a lot of these moments, early days and, and many times on repeat with this community specifically that um, this market and the, the, the ecosystem changes so quickly, but we just care. Like we, we care a lot, like a fuck ton about the community, about d God, dudes, us, all these different things. And sometimes we have an idea and we scrap it because we just know that, hey, like this is not going to move the needle. This is not going to make a difference. And um, yeah, like that, that's so much of what categorizes the, the kind of like what we always shorten the story of, you know, D God sucked and now it's fucking good. Like, I, cause I, I get it. People don't have a lot of time. Now we're doing this podcast. Maybe people are going to listen for a little bit longer. I always shorten that story, but the real nuance there is we tried to launch a lot of different things that we thought people said that people, we, we launched things that people said that they wanted. It was things that were in our roadmap it was software, it was utility, it was like these things, you know, that are impressive or whatever. And um, that made no impact. But when we did things that people really cared about that they might not be able to articulate, like fucking changing the art, you know, it's like counterintuitive, but so much of this space is irrational. So when people try to look at it in a rational way, 
I find that it's not the right framework to look at it. And you have to actually look at the space more from a perspective of what are people saying that they want? Why are they saying that they want it? And when you understand why they're saying what they want it, you understand what they're articulating that they want is just slightly different than what they actually might want or expect. Um, so yeah, I think these are the kind of learning lessons that I feel really lucky that we didn't just uh, explode and moon out of the gate. Cause I feel like we would have never learned these things, but now, you know, um, it's just really important. So, okay. So I have two questions for you off of that. My first question is, so obviously when you, your, your background is in all these different startups and things like that. And obviously some of them, like the stock trading app that you were talking about, didn't even get to the point of actually like executing that. Right. So my thing is what kept you motivated during that time? Cause you could have easily just been like, all right, you know what? We're just going to refund everybody. And we're just going to call it a day. Like, what kept you motivated at that time and like didn't and I guess made you say to yourself, OK, I actually want to learn and figure this out versus just kind of going, hey, I'm young. I still have a ton of opportunities. I have these job offers and things like that. I could go do all that and then I don't have to worry about getting clown emojis in a discord. You know, I recognize that Frank has become a lot, you know, in a lot of ways, this character um, on crypto Twitter. And I do have very ambitious goals now, especially for D God's youth and everything we're building. But at that time, um, dude, I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm just the kind of guy that I've just been working hard on whatever I do. And I just want to do good work and, and, and make cool things and, and make things that, that uh, yeah, are just dope. And so for me, when the, the moments that D-Gods gets the hardest, got the hardest, I always just, the simplest thing was, I just want to be able to go to sleep at night. <laughs> like, it's fucking stupid and people don't have to believe me, but I value integrity and doing the right thing more than almost everything else in my life and uh because I, I just i've met a lot of people that are successful and they just kind of are they did it in the wrong way and you, you know you get close enough to these people from afar um from afar it might seem alluring and interesting and i'm sure like when i was younger i had this uh maybe maybe admire those people more but i feel like the more heroes that i've met and the more i understand like people just don't do it the right way um, that's just not interesting to me at all. It, it's actually kind of depressing. And so in the darkest moments for D-Gods, uh, me, and, me and my friends that started this, we just uh, we just felt like, fuck, man, we don't, I don't want to rug. I don't want to, like, tell my kids that we're fucking rugging. Or I don't want to, like, give up and, and let these people down and make all these people lose money. Like, I think we could do this. I think we're capable. Um, and that's a big underpinning of a lot of this is it's, uh, uh, we, we say in the team, especially a lot now, it's like, we can, so we should, so we are. And not being uh, self-aggrandizing any way, I think we're actually just capable of the job. You know, I come from a growth engineering background. I think a lot of that applies in this. And same thing with the film stuff. I think, you know, Johnny, although he's he was a musical artist before this and still makes music, you know, he's been drawing, like, since he was a fucking kid. And I think, uh, you know, Taylor, a.k.a. Marcel, who's on the team, he was super successful with his e-commerce business before this. And when you just talk to him, he's one of the sharpest people, you know, you'll meet. Kevin, obviously, just really accomplished as well. So I, I just feel like we are capable of doing it. And there's, like, this sense of internal responsibility that's always weighed on me, um, whether it was the gods or anything before this, where I feel like, you know, I, I can do it, so I should. So that's why we're fucking doing it. Um, and that's why we just never gave up on it. And that's why we're not going to give up on it. Cause I know that we could do it. Maybe we f fumble some things. Maybe we fuck, fuck, fuck some things up. But I think at this point we're pretty good at predicting what we might fuck up and then having a good response for it. And, um, I think we're just getting better at our craft and yeah, that, that's kind of my overall answer there. So, so you talked about learning a lot, right? And yeah. I think there's a lot of projects obviously right now that are struggling to figure out kind of like, what is how do we get out of this, right? Like in terms of like, maybe we're taking on a little bit of water right now. How do we kind of keep the ship afloat, right? And so you talked about in December, 2021, there's no one really talking in discord. There's no real sales going on and everything like that. And so last night when I was with you, you walked me through the thought process as to why you decided to upgrade the art, right? And so I, I thought that answer was brilliant. So I want you to give that answer again of like, you talk about learning and everything like that. What did you guys have to learn that ta that kind of said to you, hey, we need to actually upgrade the art because that's a major problem that we have here? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, there's the one simple thing, which is it is the product that people buy, all right? And I think a lot of the best insights that we've had in the space is it sounds so dumb and simple, but I think people have, and there's an over 
tendency within the space to overcomplicate things. And so that makes simple insights actually really impactful and, and unique. But I think at the time, you know, we, we have a, a level of taste and we, we know what kind of looks good and bad. And I can just tell you the original D gods just look bad. And I think I'm at a point now where I really like a lot of the dead gods artwork, but I do feel like it's limiting us and our growth. And I think that us as a team have just gotten into our design bag <laughs> and our branding bag uh, since launching. And we've l grown a lot in that process. And I just feel like, uh, yeah, it, it's important for us to keep leveling up. Now, do I know if we're going to do another one after this? Like maybe, maybe not. But I think that is like maybe more of the simple high level answer. But then I can also drill down the data driven answer too. So I think um, that's the answer I'm looking for. Yeah, I think I think from a data level, what's interesting is obviously you have a lot of people back in the day that would click on our link, you know, to our website at the time. And we track that and then they would click on the, you know, Magic Eden kind of URL at the time. And then we even if we were growing that number, we just noticed down the funnel that people are just not buying. And then you go look at the floor and then you could put two and two together and be like, yeah, these fucking D gods on the floor are ugly. Why would anyone buy it? I think today now with season three, I think there's a similar element to that where the blood and the gore on dead gods, I feel is not aged as well. Um, so now I think we're taking this approach of, okay, let's clean it up. Fine. But let's, let's take a unique take on it and let's add girls as well, because that's been a limiting factor as well. So mathematically, you're just increasing your kind of buyer base there. But I think the magic of NFTs is it allows you to combine kind of data driven or logic driven insights with art and artistic driven insights. And I feel like the lane that we're taking with, uh, with this new artwork, you know, people feel like, okay, what could it fucking possibly be? Whatever it is. And I feel like we're just pretty, uh, we have a chip on our shoulder. I think we just have a, a really, really good taste. And I think this shit's going to be different. Like it's, it's just different uh, from anything else out there. And I think for an NFT project, it's just really important that they are unique. Like that's something I'm really proud of is even to this day, people have not been able to really replicate dead gods. You can have your opinions on the artwork itself, but I think it's a style and the way that we think about generative art and balancing color palettes and balancing the, you know, line work and the detail on the different traits across rarity. And then with you, it's obviously the reason why even to this day, nobody's been able to replicate the exact feel of Utes is you can look at the shading and copy that you can look at the you know style or the shape of the guy and copy that but it's actually just the balance of the colors being used on the different traits and their frequency and when they show up and when they don't show up which makes so many youths feel so balanced and why i'm proud and i don't think anyone's gonna replicate that let alone like the equal rarity and so i feel like with the new d gods it's uh it's gonna be again just very hard for people to replicate and i think that brings value to nfts in the long term when they're just very differentiated and and unique so that's kind of my, my thought process there. I think there's a lot more underneath the iceberg. Like it is also kind of a great uh, carrot on the stick for launching other things. So a lot of people just can pattern match and, and, and look at, oh, they're going to update the art. That's an easy thing. But it's kind of a Trojan horse in a lot of ways for us to rebrand the entire brand itself, you know, uh, get people to pay attention and, and reevaluate us um, in, in a new light. And so I think we can leverage these things to get more traction around the things that we launch uh, near that window. So I think there's a lot of strategy that goes into it. And then high level. Um, yeah, I mean, th th that's that's how I think about it. Yeah. OK, so what I want to get into from there is mm -hmm. the delay aspect of that. Right. Because I remember when I, I came over to the house over the summer and you were showing and this is I'm talking last summer. And this is when you were working on the art for Utes. Right. And I remember you said to me back then, you were like, Mark, it's the, it's the, it's the part of like when we go from like 90% to a hundred percent, that's really like the, where the real magic is. Right. And you were like, let me show you what dead gods looked like, <laughs> like two days before they launched. And I was like, okay. And in my head, I'm like, man, it couldn't have been that different. Like it's like two days before they launched, you know? And then you went through and you showed me all these different traits and you're like, this is what this trait looked like 48 hours before we launched. Right. And it was like mind blowing how much better the new trait was. Right. And so I think a lot of times when we talk about delays, I think people think like maybe, maybe this is something where like 
maybe maybe a team delays because they're just literally lazy and can't make a deadline or they delay because they want to like keep the hype building and they want to like farm royalties back when people were you know potentially farming royalties and all of that kind of stuff but I want you to talk about like why some of these delays have occurred and and walk me through like dead gods and how they kind of went from that 90 percent to the to the version that we know now it's funny because obviously this has become something that we're known for is the the, the delay all right, you got the fucking memes going crazy every single time. And it's funny because I, I do think it's a complex problem. And I think over time, I've been able to articulate this better. It's interesting because on one side, you have this kind of insatiable need for a NFT community to always have something to look forward to. You know, everybody wants the next thing. Oh, what's coming up? What's the catalyst? Why am I going to buy this NFT? So everybody wants this thing. And on the other side, you know, you have this unmeetable level of expectation every single time, right? Like the bigger that you get as a project, the higher the expectations go up. So not only do people want it sooner, the, the, the higher the expectations are, they also, you know, continue to press on the, the date and people really want a date. But at the same time, you know, I've never seen a team truly rewarded for perfectly hitting a date. As an example, you know, we hit our dates on Q1 2023, we had both the bridges done. And that was actually a really complex, complex fucking process. And we can go into that, but we had the bridges done and, and there's no real flowers there's no reward for that. And I look at other projects that have had bad launches, you know, they might've hit their date, but the thing that they launched had all these errors in it. You know, on top of that, they didn't really think it all the way through. They spent all this time working on it. And when they drop it, nobody gives a shit about it. And like, I've seen everything down the gamut and we've experienced moments like this where we work really hard on something and nobody cares about it. And, um, yeah, I think it's one of those things where you have to, I, we always have to balance it. And I think oftentimes getting to launch something that we're known for as well is having really good timing. And the way I see it is the, the project is almost always hovering in this state of 60 to 70% done. And then you get it to like 90% done. And when it's a 90% done, now you're just kind of like getting close, you know, to the runway. And I just always want to stick that landing. And that's something that I think we, we do pretty frequently is just stick that landing and do it at the right time. That just feels like, damn, did they predict the future or they have a crystal ball? And so that, that's how I think about, you know, delays. I, I can understand, you know, I, I have a lot of empathy for people that feel screwed over by these delays. Like, I get it. You know, I, I'm, I'm a Cardi fan. I was a Kanye fan. I'm a Frank Ocean fan. Like, as a music fan, you know, you, you feel the same way when, when your favorite artist just constantly doesn't drop something. But I also think that one of the biggest value accrual pieces of NFTs going into the future will be that having that mythical, perfect discography. Everything in your Rolodex, everything in your collect of all your collections are just, like, incredible. And I think musical artists benefit from this a lot where they don't drop a lot of mid stuff and they don't hit like it drops something every year. I mean, just recently, Travis Scott, he hasn't dropped an album in five years, you know, and he had one week of marketing rollout for it. One fucking week. Most of it was just like a bunch of tweets, had the movie premiere, had super expensive merch. And now it's on track to being one of the most streamed albums of all time within the first, you know, 24 hours. And so I think it's challenging because sometimes I feel like I have to, uh, I have to be the bad guy. And kind of just burden like, okay, I got, I want the community to feel like something is coming up soon. And we do believe that we can launch that thing. But by the time we get to that date, it's just like, okay, well, the last thing that we did was so fucking big. Is this going to be better than that last thing? And usually the answer is no. And if the answer is no, then I just feel like we set ourselves up for a bad precedent. And so now, now I feel like, okay, it's been you know, we've been working on this for some of the, some of the stuff is coming out for five, six months, which is the longest we ever worked on anything. And it's gone through so many scraps. And now I just feel like we're delivering something that like that plain analogy is just what I think a lot of people are looking for out of NFTs, just a different way to look at it. And we're packaging it up. Um, and that's what we're titling season three, Utes two, but, uh, it's the culmination of a long, you know, a long journey of what I would argue is just our best work. And it's not even close. And I think the nature of our work and how I define best is something that just deeply, deeply exceeds people's expectations, but also forces people to question, you know, 
the current paradigm of how things work. And so I'm sure somebody that doesn't know us right now is listening to this and thinking like, fuck this guy. Like, what do you mean new paradigm? What do you, you know? And, and I love that because I'm that confident in the stuff that we're making. And I feel like, uh, yeah, it's just, we, we go out of our way to creatively reward our holders and we've done it over and over again. And each time we've done it, people think to themselves, there's no way, you know, when we were going to, when we were doing Ute list before Ute list, I was, I was talking on spaces for two months telling everyone, Hey, I think we have this mechanic and I think we have this process for duppies at the time it was called duppies and the time we call it the scholarships. That's going to break the fucking internet. And just people didn't believe it. You know, everything was just going down in price. People were like, oh, getting out of the ecosystem. They're like, there's no way these guys are going to deliver. They already became number one. What's the, what's going to happen? And I think we delivered something kind of spectacular there that just blew the fuck up and literally broke the internet. And not just for one day, for, for literally a month and a half straight, you know? And, and I think, uh, obviously we fumbled on the, on the reveal and the mint process, but I think even with the bridge, if you think about how well we orchestrated it, where we made sure like all of these, like 90% of the Utes bridged on the first day, that was like two months of mechanics design, figuring out the right way to do it, making sure everyone knew that it was in Q1 so people would have their ledgers and be aware, making sure the marketing was done in a way that gives people really clear instructions, building the contract in a specific way so that we could pay for the gas. You know, that way nobody's complaining or waiting for gas to get cheaper, which would mean that if a lot, if only like some D gods bridge over on the first day and there's no buy pressure on the new chain, then people might not feel incentivized to go buy on the new chain, which means people stay on the old chain. And that's like a potential death spiral scenario for this bridge, which in the finality of it feels really, really simple and elegant. But I think that's how I want to define a lot of the work that we do. Um, yeah. So I, I just think that, you know, we will really, uh, you, you people that are critical of us can tell me that we've fallen off if the new stuff that we drop just isn't um, game changing, but I just feel like, you know, that's just the task at hand. The bigger that we get, the more that we grow, the more we have to change the game, um, at newer and newer levels. And, you know, I'm, I feel like that's exactly what we plan to do. And, and the reason we haven't launched at this point is because the things that we were making while did satisfy the thing that we said we would do, wouldn't change the game. And I just understand this ecosystem and these people too much to know that that, that just wouldn't work, it, it, which is fucked. Like you got to change the game on every fucking launch, but um, uh, I feel excited and feel like we're ready for that challenge. And, um, yeah, man, just, just, if you're watching this and you're not, uh, you're not excited about what we're doing, you don't believe me. That's totally fine. Um, I think that I'm in the camp now where people would just believe it when they see it. People have been jaded for too long. People have been burned by different collections. I get it. Um, we're fucking working out of a garage trying to make something at a global scale. And, uh, that's the game plan. And that's what I think we're going to do. I want to give my personal uh, experience of a delay on my end. So, and if you don't want me telling the story, we can cut it out at the end, but I'll, I'll just tell around Ute's release. So I remember it was, a, it was a Sunday night. I was literally sitting right where you are. I was watching TV and you called me and you were like, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, you know, like relaxing. And you were like, want to pull an all nighter tonight? And I was like, oh, no, not really. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm 30 years old. All nighters burn me out. And you were like, come over. Like I, we need to work on something. I was like, okay. So I come over. And you're like, okay, so here's the deal. We're going to, we're going to create this video. We, we talk about like all these different like FUD points, potentially for Utes. We're going to basically address every different FUD point, And then we're going to put out this video. And at the end of it, there's going to be a 24 hour like countdown. And at the end of that 24 hour countdown, Utes is going to release. Right. And so you were like, I want you to kind of like write up the questions and everything like that. The moment you're done, we'll go back to your place. We'll go, uh, you know, shoot the podcast and then we'll put it out right after that. Right. So I was like, all right, so I'm working on the questions till like two o'clock in the morning. We go over to my place, probably two 30 in the morning. You're here. I want to say along with Johnny until I think what nine 30 in the morning, something like that. Yeah. And so we, we finish at nine 30 in the morning. I send you all the video files. You were like, I'm going to edit it myself. Um, I send you all the video files. I go to bed. I wake up probably four or five hours later. I text you and I'm like, how's the video coming along? Are we still dropping it at midnight? And you were like, I'll, I'll get back to you, like working on something. I was like, all right. So um, a few hours later, I check in with you again. I'm like, yo, like, are we releasing it? And you were like, new information came in, like scrapping the whole video. And I was like, oh shit. Like we're really scrapping this thing, right? And I was like, we just stayed up until 9.30 in the morning and we're scrapping the whole thing, right? And it was a few days later. I think it was like 72 hours later, Utes releases and everything like that, right? And I remember thinking to myself, the like normal part of me goes, 
damn it. Like that was a ton of time that was like, that was just spent on this whole idea. Right. But then the other part of me goes, because I know you and I know the team well and everything like that, I know that your intention is never to waste time. But if you have a better idea, why would you just go with the other one just because we put time into it? And that's the thing that I think people don't always understand, like is that a delay is never because you truly just want to delay. It's because there's a better idea and there's something that you're working on as a result. So what we know now about Utes and everything like that, maybe if we had put out that video, maybe it wouldn't have been as good of a release, right? And I think that's the part that people have to understand. So yes, would I have loved to have gotten eight hours of sleep that night? Of course. But I want at the end of the day, what's best for the project. And if, the, if what's best for the project meant scrapping that video and doing something different, then that's just what we have to do, right? And I think that's the part where like, I had to tell myself that. And I think other people have to understand that too. What, when it comes to a delay, if you have new information that comes in that says, hey, we can improve upon this, I don't want you to just drop something for the sake of dropping it. Like if you know you can make it better and you still drop it, you're doing the community a disservice at that point in time. Right. So, I mean, I guess like that's my, just give my two cents on, on kind of what the delays have been like and you know, kind of what I experienced. So I want to get into from there, the, when you talk about like these announcements and things like that, and like, are they going to change the game and things like that? When you talk about uh, Ute List and and how all of a sudden, you know, everywhere you looked on Twitter, there were, you saw Ute List, right? It was like if any, it didn't matter what chain you were on, you saw all these ETH people all of a sudden start to get interested in a in a project that was primarily on Solana before that. And so, in terms of like when you think about announcements, how do you? I, I guess like help me with even how I'm trying to verbalize this here, but it's like. How do you think about what do we need to do to like make people continue to talk about this? Because it, obviously if you put out something and people talk about it for a day, like, yeah, you're not really making an impact. So when you guys are thinking about what's this next thing that we do, how do you internally think about that in order to make sure that this is going to be something that you release that all of a sudden the entire NFT community, not just D got holders, but the entire NFT space is talking about it. I think a lot of it is just mechanism design. So I think about, okay, first, it's all about rewarding holders. <laughs> it's that simple every time, right? It, but the game is, how do you find a creative way to reward your holders in a way that drives excitement, positive brand affinity, and also just mechanically, um, you know, we, we design in a way now, and I've learned a lot, and we've gotten a lot better at this, of... How do you stretch that out in a way that it progressively just keeps getting better and better? Um, and I think that's my high level thought process around it is it's 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 just like, you know, there, there are certain things that drive what people want. Right. Like what when, when we launch something in my mind, I'm not like, how do we go impress fucking people on Twitter? It's more like, hey, how do we make it so uh, such a no brainer to own a D God in this moment in time? Like so obvious um, that people just start buying fucking D gods. People just start buying Utes, and that that in my mind is, um, you know, wh where I think we're people are gonna see. Like that's that's just how we think about it. But I'll be honest, Mark, it's one of those things that's it's so inside baseball, and it's so kind of like uh, layered on our specific projects and 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 where we're at and our overall chessboard of like what are the pieces that we have out um, in the ecosystem right now and how can we create something that gets these people excited points obviously is interesting you know dust ute and and how can we move this so that uh yeah my goal is to just make a no-brainer product like there's a term obviously awesome right it's like how do you make an nft that is just like a no-brainer uh to, to hold and, and, and to buy so that's where my head comes to, and it, that's a fun experiment to always play around with. But I think oftentimes the answer just comes from creativity because in this space, creativity is just so deeply rewarded and packaging things in a way that makes, makes it make sense to people is always rewarded. And I think doing things just for the sake of impressing technologists on Twitter um, is, a, is a losing game, to be totally honest. And, and, and yeah, I just don't think that's how, I, how we think about it. The simple thing is, you know, how do you do things that are just so obviously like worth talking about um, that people have to talk about it and then do those on a frequent enough basis? Um, so, yeah, uh, that's how I'm thinking about it. So now now that you say all that, you know, one of the common things that people have, if people want to talk shit about D gods or Utes or whatever, or the team. The biggest thing that they say all the time is these guys aren't builders. They haven't built shit. You know, you hear that all the time. Right. 
And but yet when you're talking about all the stuff that you guys are are building, you know, building social excitement is is something like that. That's a huge thing. If anything, it might be the biggest thing. So when people say, you know, this whole team, they're not they're not builders. They don't build tech. They don't build all like what what's your response to that? Because it is a common thing that people will say, you know, when they're trying to hate on on what you guys have built. There's an interesting concept um, in in business building or business strategy, which is future demand generation and, and uh, the process internally that it takes to make that. So if you imagine like there's a graph that is flat and then it kind of like starts to curve up, that's an example of that is a business that is building something that they believe in the future will drive more demand for their product. And that is 99% of the thesis for a vast majority of NFT projects, right? It's like this idea that we are making something for the future and in the future, the demand generation will go up and to the right. Um, for me, I think what gets us a lot of controversy is that I just don't want to accept the fact that in the short term, things are just flat. In my mind, I think we do have, we, we are building towards something a lot bigger and that maybe we don't talk about as publicly, you know, there is a bigger chess move and strategy around all of this. And there has been for a while. But I just like the idea that we're going to continue to stay relevant and we're going to keep making content and we're going to keep making waves even while we're doing the future demand generation. Like, I just don't want to go quiet. I don't want to be silent. I don't want people in the community to just wait for hopefully one day we go do something, which I understand is the, the vibe and what it feels like now. But I only think it feels like this now because the market is just uh, depressingly you know, down and, and there's not a lot of reason over the last few months to say anything. And I think if we were to launch a lot of things over the last few months, it would probably just be minus EV. But it is this kind of paradigm where I, I do think I could give the summary of what my life and what a lot of people on the team's life has been since the day of the mint to today. And people would understand like there's no breaks. Like I, I, there's not been a period of time where we're like fucking off to an island or whatever. It has been nonstop. Um, but I just don't think that we... I don't think that people buy NFTs strictly because of this specific technology they built or specific thing or whatever it is. I think there's a lot more uh, emotional and uh, psychological reasons why people buy NFTs. And I feel like that's where we focus a lot more on. Um, and, and if the response to that is that we don't make things, I think that's perfectly fine because the people that are saying that would probably um, be bad members of our community in the first place because if a few people in the community are saying, oh, like, you know, when are they going to make real utility? I think that's valid and that's fair. But I feel like it under it, it, it starts to mean very little the more frequently that that happens. So like the term utility as a concept is such a broad fucking concept. Like it's literally a, a general purpose word. And so I find like the term utility or the term building has gotten to mean very little like for example, I would go bar to bar with any other project or anybody that's saying that and say, how many other projects have had over a hundred events this year already? You know, and that's just like, that's just on the side, bro. It's just like, it's just happening. We've had like a hundred plus events in every city around the world. Obviously, like we built our own kind of discord integration with, uh, with, with wallets, with delegated wallets involved. And you'll see how, why that's going to be important in the future. You know, obviously like, I, I don't, I don't think that I don't think that these things are actually like needle movers in the in the general term. And so I don't really like talk about them that much because it's kind of boring. But yeah, I just have no interest in getting into a competition about who's built this or what's built that because I think that's a losing battle for us. Um, and it's not something that I find is actually that interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, okay, so you talk about, you know, uh, picking your battles, right? So I actually want to talk about just you for a second. How have you changed as as a founder in the last like year and a half? Because I feel like at the at the time, probably a year ago, you were a little bit more combative when when there were haters on the timeline or whatever. You dealt with that like you you might have been. I think it's it's hard to go from like all of a sudden no one really knows about D gods. Then there's like some flops at the beginning, but it's still like local, like the community's calling you a clown, whatever. And then D God starts to take off. All of a sudden, there's this like mass amount of love for you, right? And then the moment you get to number one on Solana, boy, the people came out with pitchforks, you know, and I would see it all the time. We've even joked about like every once in a while, I'll put out a tweet, maybe it involves you. And next thing you know, that thing's getting copy pasted and stuff like that. And 
a year ago or so, you would kind of fight back with some fire, right? How do you, and, and that's kind of changed since then. So, so why is that? Why has that changed in your response to people and kind of some of the comments they make, uh, negative comments about, about you and the team and everything like that? I think when the negative comments first started, the thing that, the thing that hurt me the most wasn't necessarily the people saying that about me. It would be the stressed calls that I would get from my mom um, about just like fearing about my fucking safety and, uh, you know, about all these people on the internet saying like a lot of crazy things. So I feel like at first that was more of where I would get more emotional about it. But I think over time, um, I feel very grateful that there are a lot of people that were witnesses at different moments, right? Like I think that a lot of D God holders know that we've gone out of our way to do the right thing every single time. Whenever we fuck anything up, whenever we do something wrong or, or we make a mistake, we go out of our way. Um, oftentimes not benefiting us in any way to, to make it right. And so I feel very grateful these days that there are just so many people that were there and have seen it. It's like a lot of people that are in, in D gods now at one point or another, were honestly, um, dicks to me on Twitter. They like did not like us. They had their own preconceived notions about it. And then they saw us do something that was, you know, what high integrity. And, um, th this converts people, this makes people see like, Hey, you know, wh whatever you're hearing about these guys, it, it might not be true. And I think for me now, um, I, I just care about, can I go to sleep at night? And I, I hold myself to a really high moral standard. And when we make mistakes, we make hard decisions. Sometimes I feel like even to this day, there's stuff that I can't, and I don't have any interest in like airing out or talking about in public, but I know that we made a sacrifice um, for the greater good of the community. And sometimes like the community will never know about half of these things, but there's a lot of this stuff where I, I feel very proud of the work that we've done so far. I feel very proud of the team that's behind this and, and the decision that we've made in the past. Um, and I feel like we're just going to keep making high integrity decisions because it pays off. And if you're in, uh, there's certain things that we've done that I think in the time that it's played out, hasn't been super effective, didn't work out the way we thought it would. And what you will see over the next few weeks and over the next month is we will go back and we will fix every fucking one of those for as long as we're still breathing. And that's like a, it's just how we operate. It's just how we, this is how a company fucking started. It started out with us not touching any fucking mint money because we thought we were going to give it all back because, you know, we just didn't want to, we didn't want that on our conscience. And that is the company culture. And that is the, the fucking culture of, of everything that's gotten us here. And that just won't change. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's like at the end of the day, whatever people are saying about me on the internet, my guess is like, the people that are the most passionate about it will probably become like Frank slash D labs fanboys after the next time that we run up. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's just what happens every time they're like, Oh, um, I didn't realize this. And, and it's just because there's so much of misinformation out there and there's all these different things, but I know that we're going to just keep doing the right thing and people can hold me accountable to that in the public. I hold myself more accountable than anything. And, um, yeah, I just know we're going to do the right thing every single time for everyone that backs us. Okay, so one of the questions I want to go to next is one of the most common criticisms for D gods is what have they built? They're always they're just they're all they do is build hype. All they do it's it's all hype. There's nothing else. They haven't actually built shit. So to the people who say D gods hasn't built shit, what is your response to that? Yeah, I people say this all the time and I get it. I totally understand where it comes from and uh I think that the terms utility and build have taken on to mean so many different things to different people. So I feel like the best way to respond to this is I'm just going to take you down a brief uh, story of basically from Mint to today, and I will explain every part of the process, and then people can evaluate from there. So we basically Mint uh, October 2021. We Mint, and the first thing we're supposed to do is make this uh, custom marketplace. So we make it, and it's broken, and it breaks, and then uh, people get their D gods locked up in there. And so then because people got their D gods locked up, we had to spend the next... 12 days manually re airdropping everyone that got their D gods locked up after that ends. Then we start working on what was called D.XYZ at the time. D.XYZ was this uh, blogging tool that we had put in our roadmap that we said we wanted to make that would allow for people to create content and then get tipped 
by users, um, you know, at the time. So we spent like two, three weeks building that. And then we launched that right after that people started flooding. They weren't happy with it. So then we go and launch, uh, you know, D dot, uh, then we go and launch D gods week from D gods week. Then we go and make uh, D palace, which was a private Reddit forum tool that we had spent four weeks fucking making and nobody gave a shit about that. And then that was the dark days of D gods. That's when we started to reevaluate everything. So from that point we got, I think I spent four or five days really, really trying to figure out what the next wave of D gods would be that would bring us back. And that's when the ideas for dead gods and dust came about. Then we hit January and uh, then we start rolling on, on dead gods. We announced dead gods from, from that point to then for the next two months, we're building out basically raffles and auctions and utility for dust while at the same time making dead gods in that time, the excitement for dead gods started to really drive. I came on your podcast. The excitement for dead gods really started to drive so heavy that we actually went, went from being like a dead project on soul to literally, you know, growing a hundred X. And then basically you know, right before dead gods came out, we were the number one project on soul out of nowhere, kind of like the Cinderella story. And so people were like, this is over. The run is done, you know, like it's done. And then we dropped dead gods and people had seen like, holy fuck, like this is different. And, uh, obviously continue to grow. I think we three, four X after that, um, just kept growing like crazy. We were just, just blowing up. And then right after that, we bought the basketball team. And then we kind of went through a lot of FUD through that, um, being the first. And then a lot of these other teams kind of followed on. And then right after that, we started the process for duppies and we had this idea for this thing, scholarships, which at the time um, nobody really thought anything of, they were like, okay, it's over now. Like, there's no way, you know, the guys are going to come back. It's like, okay, whatever the fuck duppies is, it's probably going to tank. It's probably a cash grab, whatever it is. And so then we start working on duppies and scholarships, scholarships, uh, ended up becoming, you know, Ute list and duppies ended up becoming Utes. Obviously Ute list went kind of fucking crazy. And uh, while Ute list was going crazy, we were doing our raise on dust labs where we essentially created a new company um, brought Kevin on board. And this was during the time that Utlist was going parabolic and everyone in, on crypto Twitter was talking about us for a month straight. Um, Utlist ends. And then obviously the famous drama of like, you know, tubes and us not having the art ready. And obviously there was like 50 things going on in the background with dust slabs to like ma managing 70,000 people applying and fucking farming on every single angle and everyone talking about us and criticizing us, whatever it is. So then we're just not happy with the art. And so we go into a process of refactoring the whole thing. Those two months that we're refactoring everything, Dust Labs is hiring their first employees, getting started, and uh, we're working on the artwork um, and, and trying to get it to a place where we feel really proud of it. And so right after that comes out is when fucking, obviously during that time, by the way, royalties go to fucking zero. Magic Eden hit zero. Um, everyone is capitulating on Solana. And then we finally get Utes out. And then like, I think a week or two after that, FTX collapses. And at this time we had gotten like, you know, I think 20 to 30 customers uh, that were pretty high value for for scholarships, which is the first product, which, you know, the model was we go and launch something really sick for our, for our projects, the gods and Utes, and then we make it really successful. And then we package that and, uh, you know, sell that software. And so right after FTX crashes, almost all of our client lists and, and potential, you know, future customers all decide they don't want to fucking mint. And so they all drop off the fucking map. And then obviously I have my tweet that goes crazy about potentially wanting to move off of Solana. And then we have this whole internal debate of whether or not we want to, um, you know, whether or not we want a bridge or whatever it is, we make the decision internally. And in this time we're building the staking platform with points. And, uh, then on Christmas we announced that we're going to bridge. And then we basically go down this pathway of trying to figure out what the best way to bridge is, because if we just gave people a one way bridge or a two way bridge, our thought process was new liquidity wouldn't find itself on the new chain. Oh, also I forgot, you know, we were working on figuring out, um, you know, how we can go to a new blockchain with Utes and obviously raise capital without, without charging the holders, but do it in a way that we felt would have high upside, um, which people can debate today, but that was the thought process at the time. And then we start figuring out the mechanics. We tap wormhole and the team at jump to see if we can build a custom bridge that would allow for us to pay for the gas upfront for our holders so that people will be, uh, you know, incentivized to do it all at once. And then we start working on that contract in collaboration with jump and, uh, spend a solid amount of time making that work. Then on the front end, 
making sure that obviously people could do it in bulk all at once. We have a queuing system so we don't overcharge the gas because we were paying for the gas. And so then we, we finally get to the new chain. We, by the way, we're scrapping everything that we made on Seoul at this point and having to remake it on ETH to a, to a large degree. And so then we get to, then we get to ETH and Polygon. And then from there, we start working on obviously what is now going to be, you know, DGOD season three, Utes two. Um, right after we, we land on the new new blockchains, we start working on our identification system, which ended up being DID, which a lot of new stuff is coming out around. And pretty much that is like the history thus far of the two projects. And there's like a million little things across the board. You know, the Killer Threes, it's like, uh, obviously that's been exciting. A uh, few merch drops in, in, in between and, and a, a bunch of little branding things and community things. We've had like a hundred events, I think throughout this year. Um, so it's been a lot in the process. D New York, I forgot about that. That was actually, yeah, that was right before or after. I think it was right, yeah, right after the bridge. And so all these things have kind of, it's been like a nonstop process, to be totally honest, since, since the Mint. Do I feel like we have built things? I think the answer is like an unequivocal yes. Do I feel the need to go and flex all the fucking technology or all the things that we've built? Not really, because I don't think people really give a shit about it. Um, but I do think that going forward, I want the frequency in which we launch things that are impactful to go up, um, dramatically. And so I think that is where I think internally we need to improve. Oh, and by the way, in that entire story that I was describing, you know, the team grew and shrunk, we laid people off, we brought people on and like refactoring a team and, and, and for growing a team in an environment where you're constantly changing because we have to, um, has been the one of the more challenging things I think any of us have done in our life. And so, yeah, I, I, I do definitely feel like we've made a lot of stuff. And, and I think that it's impossible to win some of these debates on Twitter because the people that are asking that question typically have a malicious intent. And so that's something that I've just learned over time is the people that are asking that are not going to buy DGOT anyway. So why the fuck does it matter? Um, they're not going to buy you anyway. So why does it matter? But yeah, it's been a fucking nonstop, uh, nonstop journey thus far and i do feel like the only thing that i i think we can continue to improve on is our efficiency at dropping things that actually have an impact that we are proud of and the time that it takes to make those things um so yeah uh, uh that's my response to like have we built anything uh maybe maybe not uh, i guess we just do things. some just did we just do some shoe oh yeah there's a bunch of shoeies <laughs> along the way as well um, so, okay. So you talked about how the team has kind of grown and shrunk and things like that. What can you tell me about like how the team has evolved over time? Cause obviously like what you guys were capable of a year and a half ago versus what you're capable of now, drastic difference. Right. So, so tell me kind of how is the, how's the team grown? How, how, I guess, like, have you guys, uh, internally, um, changed the ways that you kind of operate in order to be, you know, more efficient and to, and to do, you know, more, more and more epic things. And yeah, just tell me kind of more or less, how has the team evolved? One of the more challenging things, uh, of running this company in public and, and to this degree of, uh, public is, I feel like the scrutiny that NFT projects get are equivalent to um, public companies in a lot of ways, um, especially on this like little segment of Twitter that we're on. And so I do feel, I feel responsibility to protect and shield the team from a lot of criticism because th nobody signed up for that. You know, it's like nobody signed up for people just uh, being dicks on the internet uh, towards the thing that they're working really hard on. And so part of my responsibility that I feel a lot of times is just make sure we're working on the right thing. Make sure our ideas aren't fucking stupid. Make sure like the scope takes into account all of the complexity that goes into launching something in this space. But I do feel like our team now is smaller than it has been at times in history, but more effective in a lot of ways because everyone, I, I look to my left, I look to my right, everyone's a killer and everyone is capable of getting their part of the equation done. Um, I do think we need to scale the team out, but you'd be surprised, you know, in, in, in a space like this, if you're not ready to for things to change and shift and get scrapped, I just feel like it's you're, you're probably not a fit for for our culture, and so that's been one of the more challenging things to adapt to overall. And I think you have to just be ready for your work to be so deeply scrutinized to an ungodly degree. Um, and I think everyone on our team at this point is is uh, capable. Of, of that and, and in that lane. And some of the people that are in certain positions are, I'd argue, the best in this industry at what they do. 
And um, I don't want to say, you know, my opinion on the specific people there because, you know, there's a large team that we're trying to grow here. So we're about 14 strong at this point. Um, and I think we'll grow that size. But I, I think what we've learned is if someone's a culture fit, that's probably one of the more important things, which I never felt. I'm, you know, I'm 24 right now. I felt like, OK, just hire the best people. But I think you run into a lot of problems when those people have an ego or don't want to like work with the culture and work with things that align around the holders, uh, you know, goals and benefits. So yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of the team right now. So one of the team members that maybe doesn't have an actual name or personality is, uh, AI, right? You've, you've, uh, you've talked about it on Twitter spaces kind of recently, yeah. some of the different ways that you've utilized AI. So can you give me like AI has probably been the most common buzzword of 2023 and yeah. so what can you tell me about i guess like what were your initial thoughts on ai and then how have you guys used ai in order to you know solve some of the problems that you guys have faced or just like how has ai helped d labs overall my funny story about this is i uh i've been using gpt3 since uh, 2020 so my <laughs> i remember seeing it pop off on startup twitter and uh, I wanted the access to the API so bad because I was literally in coding boot camp at this time and I just wanted to like get access to it. It looked so crazy. Um, and so I, I wrote like, please GPT on my mask uh, at the, like, cause everyone was wearing masks back then. And I posted a picture of me with thumbs up with like, please GPT on Twitter. And uh, that's how I got my first access to GPT-3 all the way back then. And I definitely kind of fell off from using it for a while. But when 3.5 came out, when ChatGPT, which is like 3.5, came out because I was using it so much before back in the day when it was pretty rudimentary I, I instantly to me and I'm sure a lot of people say this but like instantly to me I I was like holy fuck like this is different this is crazy and um I think I'm ready to give my secret sauce around a AI here exclusive on the uh, Mark Colser podcast because now we're so close to the launch you know fuck it why not um yes so I think where people are misusing GPT-4 the most is they are treating it like Google or a search engine where I think it is truly incredible is actually on logic problem solving and complex problem solving. And so I think the key to GPT and this is how we use it internally is I have a, a D, D GPT or the D constitution. And in that constitution, there is like the history of the projects, you know, our goals and all of these are components that I've wrote, written out, you know, then the specific launches that are coming up, holder profiles or like customer, you know, customer profiles. And what I'll do is I'll give GPT, you know, the most efficient context that it can, I can about this, about the problem or the thing that we're uh, going to launch. And then I'll kind of have it simulate its reaction um, from the perspective of a holder. I'll ask it to find holes. I'll ask it to act like it's a black hat, black hat hacker and is trying to exploit the system. Uh, a plethora of these kind of different systems. And I find like it has an 80% hit rate um, of, of really delivering interesting insights that are super specific to our project in a way that is very hard for you to find, um, you know, from just thinking about it or talking to other people or interviewing people or whatever it is. And so that has been where GPT has been pretty fucking insane. And um, I was doing this for months and they just recently added the feature uh, custom instructions. And that is essentially kind of what we've been doing with this constitution. And they just like made it a lot easier for people to use. So that would be my feedback or advice for projects that are trying to figure out how to make it useful. It's really about giving it the right context. And you don't want to give it too much um, because there's context windows. So GPT-4 by default has an 8K con token context window, which means that once you go past about 8,000 characters, let's just call it roughly, you know, it starts to hallucinate or starts to forget some of that stuff. So part of the game is actually just making sure you're giving all the most relevant information and then, um, you know, asking the follow-up questions there. But yeah, there maybe one of these days I'll drop some of these chats, but a lot of some of the ideas or ways that I'm really glad that we've... Uh, um, thought through and covered all our bases with what we're, what's coming up with what we're launching is thanks to thanks to GPT. But it's just really not about automation today. To me, it's more about um, enhancing your thinking and, and, and almost having like an omnipotent uh, being review the things that you're working on and helping you derive smarter solutions that take all of the context in mind um, and, and, and output something really cool. So... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. Like, I didn't even know the, the 8k characters and everything like that. That's super interesting. The, 
Okay, so here's where I want to go to from there. You've talked, all, you've mentioned a few times the events, right? Events has become this kind of major part of the whole like D Gods and Utes ecosystem. Is there's constantly events, whether it's there were events at NFT LA, NFT New York. There's been events in Paris with Pudgy Penguins. I know there's some stuff coming up in I think it's like Singapore, right? And there's you know we've had all these like smaller events in in Miami, and uh, I think there was one in like Fort Lauderdale at one point. There's been stuff in LA. There's been stuff in San Francisco, all over, right? And so. What is kind of like the general thesis as to like why these events are so important? And like, when did you realize, I guess, that like these events were going to become such a major aspect of the D-Gods and Utes ecosystem? So it's interesting because I grew up um, honestly going throughout high school without a lot of friends. Um, and, and I would spend most of my time on internet forums and subreddits and things like this. Uh, almost all day. Like I get back home, I watch the movies, I just be on Reddit or I'd be on, you know, whatever the fuck I would find on the internet, just random, random pockets, definitely just a full blown internet kid. And almost every friend that I've made in my life, you know, to this point has almost always been something centered around an interest. It, you know, it's been rarely like location based or city based where it's just like around common interests. And so one of the things that I think is interesting is it, a lot of other people have shared that experience. Like the loneliness epidemic is fucking real. Like people are just finding it harder and harder to make friends. And the older that you get, the more difficult it becomes to find close friends. And so it was pretty magical because right after I got doxxed, it's like it started this new renaissance for our community and our project where now events are kind of a main staple. And why I think that's important is one of the things I think is going to become more important as we scale this project out and more people find out about it is our ability to have a community all around the world that is very, very uh, engaged and active and, and want to meet other people within this community. So you have like one type of relationship between like with a global audience that is this huge creator and then you have like their fans. And I think in those scenarios, it's a lot like if you're two, two people that are fans of, uh, you know, Aiden Ross or of Elon Musk, it's, it's unlikely that they have a fucking meetup group, right? It's just like, bro, you can talk about it on the internet. You don't really need to meet each other. Where I think for NFTs, everyone kind of had this initiation <laughs> that, you know, we all bought a fucking D-God. We all bought a U. We all bought this like NFT. And uh, I think that just gives people an excuse to want to meet each other. But I do think that as we scale out, there is this magical utility that I think we're, we're already starting to provide, but can get a lot better with software and streamlining this, which is coming down the pipeline of, you have this magical JPEG on the internet. And what it allows you to do is go to any city on any major city on planet fucking earth and have homies that you can hit up and just have a local experience and have a, uh, you know, get perks and, and, and a great experience in these cities. And, and, and a lot of D got holders have experienced this. I mean, you were telling me about the guy that what was the story of the guy that moved to LA and Jason. So we, yeah, yeah we had a, a meetup at a brewery last week in LA and we're there and this guy, Jason walks up bubbly full of energy. And he's like, he's like, Hey guys, like, nice to meet you. I'm Jason. I'm a, I'm a D got holder. I just moved out to LA. And I was like, Oh nice, man. When'd you move out here? Three hours ago. I'm like, like, you're joking, right? He's like, no, no, no. Legitimately insane. Insane. moved out here three hours ago, went on the D God website, saw an event tonight, and was like, yeah, I'm going to pop out and meet everybody. And we've actually already gotten together again since then. We went to go get lunch the other day, talk about, you know, learning more about his background. He's learning more about mine. We went and ended up getting coffee with a few other people, too. And it's like, that is like, that's it's my favorite utility. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to replicate. And I think oftentimes... When I think about value accrual for our communities and for the NFTs, I think it's just important that we keep finding these deeper moats that are just very, very difficult to find anywhere else. And I just think that this problem, like globally across the fucking world, it's just hard to make friends, bro. It's like real shit. Like, I know people that are listening to this and thinking about it. I'm like, when's the last time that you made a close friend? And I think uh, that is something that I just feel really proud of when I go to sleep at night and I think about what is like the real work that we're doing here, like what impact have we made? Man, the amount of stories that I've uh, received and heard of people that have made close friends because of this fucking community, whatever people on the outside want to judge or say whatever they want to say, I don't give a fuck. Because if it means the people that are in our squad and our circle are um, enhancing their lives and, and one new best friend, like one new close friend can genuinely change the trajectory of somebody's life. I know that so much of what we talked about earlier in this podcast is how much my close friends have changed 
the entire trajectory of not only my life, but clearly the trajectory of a lot of other people's lives. And so when it all is said and done with this JPEG mania, um, I do think that the thing that will stick around are, are these closer relationships. And I think that NFTs have a unique ability to, um, to make that happen. And we rebranded D Labs recently, obviously, to the friendship company. And I think that there is an element of it that I find is beautiful synergy between we want people in the community to meet up and become closer to each other, but we also want to give them interesting things to talk about. You know, I think about it a lot like a sports analogy where if you're like a basketball fan, there is a 24-7 media cycle where you can talk about the latest trades, you can talk about the la latest game, there's off-the-court drama, there's on-the-court drama, there's highlights, there's media fucking empire created around just NBA, the basketball players, and obviously this is with a lot of sports. And what I found fascinating, this happened organically, is we kind of just make so much noise on the regular basis that there's always something to talk about with D-Gods. And I find like um, if we can continue to do that but better and make it so that more new shit is coming out more frequently, my guess is this is a virtuous cycle that continues to grow and, and drives even closer engagement and uh, you know closer m makes the relationships of people within the communities even closer. But I think there's a balance they have to strike where if it becomes too corny, it becomes a little lame. And that's where I find our sweet spot with most things. I think most ideas that we have, when people try to replicate it, they fail because they just don't have that taste and they, they, they just don't get it. You know, and when, when you don't get it, it's really, really tough. But I feel like we're going to always toe that line and make sure the shit that we do is, is cool and differentiated um, and interesting. Like one of the things I keep thinking about is obviously these pickup basketball games are fucking crazy, you know? And it's like, there's a lot of people that don't even hold D gods or use that come out and they're web three adjacent. And that's like the type of event to me that is way more interesting than throwing a party at a club. Um, and it's funny because we've gotten criticism sometimes because some videos go viral of some dude doing a worm <laughs> or the shoeies or whatever it is. But I think what people need to understand is the people that are running this project are a lot closer to internet nerds than they are to, uh, frat boy, you know, pop star type dudes or whatever it is. And so for me, one of my goals, and I talk to the team all the time about this. I kind of want to have like a Fortnite tournament at a book out a fucking movie theater, have people from around the country fly out around the world and like hype that up and do a fucking Fortnite tournament in a movie theater or obviously like do a bigger version of the pickup, the pickup basketball thing. I think going to a basketball event, going to golf with D golf. These are the kind of things that are the seeds that we're planting right now. But I think people are sleeping on how much of a mainstream news story this stuff is going to become when we actually become bigger as a brand. And, and uh, that is uh, what I'd argue is the chess move that we're playing with these events that I don't mind playing the dumb guy on Twitter or the dumb frat guy because it's uh it's easier for people to bucket or categorize and you know we'll we'll make it obvious when it's time to make it obvious but there's like a pretty deep-seated strategy with how we can run events to grow our audience and find buyers that can actually afford the nfts at increasing prices because that is going to be one of the strongest growth levers is simply just referrals um and people that come to events that they might not hold the NFT, but they see all these people that do hold the NFT and they feel the most compelled um, viscerally to get into the collection. And then uh, that is actually a compounding growth loop because if there's a lot of people in a city that hold that NFT and then we start marketing like DLA, you know, like D Singapore, whatever it is. Um, if we start marketing in that way, then I think we're going to be able to capture the entire market of people that are, uh, you know, that have the money to afford it that are Web3 adjacent in that city, it's gonna become the no-brainer NFT to buy. And I think people are sleeping on how much um, <laughs> how much of a fucking crazy impact that could be. And I don't even mind saying it out loud at this point because I think our moat there is just so fucking massive. And uh, if other projects wanna to try to execute on this, I think they're gonna have a hard time because they just haven't, the people in their community might just be more like mercenaries than, than, uh, you know, than, than they think. And I think for our community, the reason why people are so confused, and if you're like a new person that doesn't know a lot about us right now, the people are so confused, like, why the fuck is D-Gods this shitty art thing or whatever? Why are these guys like at this floor or whatever it is? What I, think they under, what I don't think they understand is we pretty rarely do marketing that attracts mercenaries or people that are just like not about it. And what that leads to over time is you start to just have a community that is all 
uh, down for the fucking mission. They all want to see D-Gods get to number one. And once we get to number one, it's going to get even crazier. And I think that's just hard to replicate and something that we've earned over the last year and a half. And then we're going to just continue to stick to our guns and, and grow in the right ways every single time. So when you when we talk about events too, yeah. the the thing that I feel like we we haven't touched on enough yet is the killer threes, right? And so I want to I want to deep dive that for a second. So when when that was announced, that was fudded like absolute crazy, right? These guys just bought a basketball team, but they didn't actually buy it. They technically, you know, there's always the like, well, they don't technically own the team. There are always those people. There were other people of like, are people actually even going to watch the big three? There were all these comments that were made at the time, right? And I think there were some holders who kind of saw the vision. There were some who were like, yeah, I don't really get it, right? Maybe I don't give a shit about basketball and I don't, I don't really understand what the point of all of this is, right? And I think right now we're seeing how that's kind of playing out of like, there's been all these events all throughout this summer in Miami, in New York, and now there's one coming up in Charlotte. There's been games in Memphis, and, and there's people who are going to these events nonstop. Holders, maybe people who aren't huge basketball fans, but now they're going, and it feels it feels like every single weekend I'm seeing like a family get together, and it's the coolest damn thing. So was that the initial like goal of it, or what, were, what was the initial goal of purchasing the Killer Threes, and I guess how has it played out since then? Buying sports teams is part of the bigger, the bigger thesis with this project. And um, I'll break it down for you right now. Here's my thinking. What are we fucking building here with D-Gods, with the youth? Like, what is the idea? What's the goal? What, what are we trying to make? And I, I just think that people would be able to evaluate this project a lot more clearly if they understood what I'm about to say. My goal is to create the ultimate luxury item and, and create many of those. And when I think about what makes something a luxury item, I think it's something that you can, that everyone recognizes as something that has value. I think it's something that you can flex on your friends and has some type of signaling. And I think it's something that uh, is just well-crafted and made with a lot of thought, care, and love. And so I'll break down my thinking on this. What we just talked about right before this was events. I think that if the end state of events is that you can flex on your friends and pull out your phone and say, I can go to any fucking city in the world and I'm going to have people that are going to want to hang out with me and give me a VIP experience in all of these cities. I think that's a flex you can't find anywhere else in the world. I think owning a sports team and feeling that sense of ownership towards a sports team and feeling like you can watch it grow and potentially one day we're going to probably sell the sports team and people seeing that journey from where it started to the flip and, and the value that we're going to flip that, you know, that, that sports team at is going to be pretty sick. And I think um, that is something that is, you know, I believe is going to be a bigger part of like luxury culture is like owning these second tier teams is actually a sick flex and something that I think people find a lot of enjoyment in, especially as content gets easier to produce. It's easier for people to record these games, clip it up and for these teams to find relevance without having to be uh, broadcast on national TV. So that's kind of the global shift that's happening there. And then I think about the artwork. And I'm like, okay, we want to make sure that the artwork feels something that's luxury and premium. And you're going to see that with the new D-Gods, um, you know, season three artwork. And obviously you see it with Utes as well. And then obviously the other part of it too is everyone's talking about it, right? The magic of going viral and what breaking the internet really means is that when you see something crazy happening, people on CNN might be talking about it. You know, everyone on Twitter is talking about it. That makes you feel sick as a holder. You know, it's fucking dope. It's like, oh shit. Like everybody's talking about our project right now. I hold this thing. I own this thing. That's also a dope feeling. And so I think those are the things I'm comfortable saying publicly right now. The other things I, uh, I, uh, uh, and, and okay. The last thing is obviously when the NFT is just printing you money, that's also fucking sick as well. And so we, we think about these things on a spectrum and I think, how can we tackle these things in a creative way um, that helps us get to that end state where it's just such a fucking no brainer. Like it's just like a beyond no brainer that holding this thing gives you everything you could possibly fucking want out of an NFT. And it's not even a choice anymore. It's just like, Oh yeah. Oh, you own NFTs. You, you have a D guy. Oh, like, Oh dude, that's fucking sick. And I think that today you're watching the Rocky road of, of, of making that happen. But I think our eyes are laser focused on that because I feel like if we can create that and do that well and build a process to do that, as our audience grows, we're going to be able to do that with newer IPs 
in the future. And I have no intention to kind of dilute our ecosystem right now. I think we'll wait until, you know, Bitcoin's at like 60K, until D God's number one and Ute's number two, or maybe the other way around. I think we'll wait until there's just an oversubscription of demand for another collection. I don't think we're anywhere close to that today. So um, that's how I look at it. And I think that's what we're building in a lot of ways um, in the long term is just what can we create value for, for our little tiny section in, of the internet? And how can we do that in such a in-depth fucking powerful way? Um, and, and just be anal, anally focused on doing that. And I think if we do that um, well, then we're going to be in a really, really good spot to do the things that are the next part of the chess moves um, that would make us even bigger and more important in the grand macro landscape of things. But right now we're dumb jocks and or uh, dumb frat boys that, you know, want to do shoeies or whatever. <laughs> So, okay, so I want to talk about before we dive further into because you mentioned a second ago, like, what are the goals kind of once once we get to number one, right? So before we dive into all of that, what I want to go into from there is the current NFT space, right? Like, let's we'll get depressing for a second before we get to the exciting stuff, right? So the space right now seems it's for a lack of better terms, it's boring, right? Like it seems like every big announcement that's come out has flopped. It seems like there hasn't been a project that's mooned in a long time. And so why do you think that is like, why do you, do you think in a way it's the space maturing and people are kind of saying to ourselves, like, we know more now, like we're not going to just give random people millions of dollars for no reason. Like we, we are demanding like you to actually do some cool shit with this. Like, what do you think it is? Why do you think the NFT space is boring right now? I think that it's underrated how hard it is to satisfy this fucking, uh, audience, to be honest. Like, uh, I think that you, you have this challenge where people are asking for, you know, to deliver X, Y, or Z thing. But then there's this kind of a subtle thing that the, the quiet part that people don't say out loud, which is once that thing is delivered is usually the moment that the project goes on a downward trajectory. <laughs> Think about that. All right. That's actually like a, a very, very core paradigm problem that I think exists in the space today. And obviously without royalties, like, you know, People not wanting to spend any money on anything because they were burned so much in the bull market. I think no new entrance and the market keeps shrinking. Obviously, you have blur and this financialization aspect of it. I think all of these things, what they lead to is a very muddy answer as to what people want. And so I think it makes it very hard to make something that people want in the space. And so I think the lack of incentives for anybody, um, pair that with this brutal like view of all these projects like nuking and kind of like fucking up and capitulating and all these different things. Um, I think it makes it like a, a low incentive environment. And when there's a low incentive environment, obviously in the, in the macro, like people just do less, but I think even for the teams that want to do something, I'd argue that a vast majority of things that be, like, you remember when airdrops were the fucking thing? Oh, yeah. Now everyone's like, go, bro, 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 please. Like, don't fucking airdrop, don't dilute, don't do this, don't do that. And that's, like, new, you know? I mean, that was, that's relatively new. Um, obviously, now, with uh, Blur kind of taking over the scene, now, I compare Blur in a lot of ways to, like, StockX and uh, GOAT. My example is, I remember when sneaker flipping and, and that whole market was early in, 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 on the internet, and people were just doing it on eBay, and then it would have this kind of huge, it had this huge run-up you know, with Supreme and some of these Jordans and all these kind of exclusive drops. And people were still selling that on eBay. And that's when prices were going crazy. People were making insane money. People were going to the stores, camping out. And then the financialization of that market happened. What I mean is startups came out. They were like, oh, this is this problem. It's really hard to buy. It's really hard to sell. So, you know, let's, we're going to make this thing, this aggregator, StockX, Go, these different types of aggregators. But what ends up happening is the easier that you make it to sell your Jordans or whatever, the more the price is just going to get dampened, right? It's like, that's how, that's how volatility gets dampened. And I think the same thing is happening now with blur. It's like, did that kill the sneaker market? No, right. It didn't, but did it definitely kill the incentive for flipping and and reselling like your, like sneakers a hundred percent. And so I think what you're seeing now is a different landscape for that market. And I think for NFTs, it just happened in a much faster um, much more accelerated time period. And so I'm just like ready to adapt to the newer um, environment. And where I think most projects maybe just took the wrong lessons from the, the bull market is 
I just don't think you can get around this attention economy shit. It's just impossible. Like, if nobody knows about what you're launching or what you're doing, like, you know, it's the if the tree falls in the forest, you know, and nobody hears it, did it really fall? And I think that people underrate how difficult it is today to get on the timeline. <laughs> like, just to get on people's fucking for you page. It's getting harder and harder. And just making something and tweeting about it once is just not going to work anymore. And so you'll see this coming up now pretty soon. Um, you'll see this with uh, season three. I'm probably going to be tweeting like 200 fucking times a day, bro. You know, once the thing drops. Um, because it just makes sense. It's just like a logical thing. Like the more times I tweet, the more impressions, the more people are going to see it. And it's my job to try to make it quality. or like good tweets or not just a bunch of dog shit. But um, yeah, I think the people don't have enough of a content minded approach. And I think the quietness, it's something that can be used as a strategy but should definitely not be the default and i think that's the thing that people are the most jaded about is like if you're not going to give me this crazy money printing utility can you at least entertain me <laughs> can you at least give me some content can you at least do this and um my guess is the crop of the next wave of nfts that pop off it's going to be teams that are just goaded with making content and just are making that shit on the regular and and, uh, and constantly kind of like putting things out there. I think this Jack Butcher model is probably going to be a lot closer to what we see, um, you know, for NFTs. And people are going to have their own spice and flavor on it. And obviously Jack is once in a generation talent. But that's my guess on where things are likely going to go. And I think that the copium of this idea of these like goaded founders that uh, are omnipotent, that know what to do and are just like, chess masters ma maestros behind the scene like you know while they're not saying anything there's crazy shit happening i think people are just like nah probably not you know um even for us i feel like i feel like we do have a little bit of a chess game going on here with uh how we're gonna launch things but there's a level of humbleness that comes with it where yeah i am i'm 24 we're fucking grinding all day sometimes i'll tweet some i'll shit post or whatever it is i'm like a human being or there's human beings on this team um but I also think we've been doing this for a really long time. Like how many projects are still kind of growing almost two years into it. A lot of them hit their plat like peak a while ago. Um, and, and so I think like for us, we're just in a unique spot. So I do feel a chip on our shoulder of, uh, I think we know what we're doing, but always down to be wrong there. But that's my kind of read on the space right now. It's a mix of the incentives are low busted. And then on top of that, I think there's this old model from the bull market that is just not going to work going into the future. And I think that people are very addicted to their um, remembering their all time high portfolio values. And I think it's uh, yelling at people on Twitter is not likely going to make them able to put out something that's going to get some of these NFTs back to their you know all time values. So you mentioned a few times in their blur. So, you know, blur is one of the things where I feel like everybody, you know, people either like love it or they absolutely hate it. And there's kind of no in between. Right. Mm -hmm. And so on your end of things, like, how do you look at blur? Because I know one of the common things that people kind of complain about is that it, it hinders uh, true price discovery. Right. And so I guess like, what are your thoughts on blur? And I guess like, how do you how do you think about like how to, I guess, overcome the people who are blur farming and things like that in order to truly get, you know, price to, to moon when all of a sudden there's all these people who are constantly buying, flipping for a loss because they're looking to get these blur points and things like that. So how do you, how do you look at all of that? And how do we kind of overcome, I guess, some of the inherent like negatives that come along with blur while embracing the positive at the same time? Yeah. I mean, I think my comparison with the, uh, sneaker, market is kind of interesting a way to look at it and i think the answer remains the same and it's just very 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 simple um <laughs> there just needs to be more demand than there is uh you know people that want to sell and i think that there's different ways to there's different ways that that can be impacted whether it's everyone loves what we're about to do with points and so <laughs> everyone's delisting at a crazy rate and new people want to buy that could go kind of crazy uh we'll see what happens but um yeah, I do think that it's just a, it's, it is still a simple equation at the end of the day. It's just more demand than so, than the supply available. Um, I think it complicates things, but I really just, I just don't, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys that's going to blame Blur. It's just like, it's not Blur's fault. They're just going to do their thing for their fucking reasons. And we just can't complain about it. I don't know what else to say, man. It's going to do its thing. And I think that the, you, you just can't overcomplicate it. You, you have to make something that more people want to buy than, than sell. So, okay, so then we, when we talk about the demand having to be higher than the amount of people who are selling and everything along those lines, 
how do we find more people who can afford a DGOT? Obviously, like what, like when you're trying to market towards those people, what is that group of buyers looking for? And are all those buyers already in Web3? Or like, how do we get those people who maybe aren't, don't give a shit about Web3, don't know that Web3 even exists? How do we get those people to be interested in DGODs and Utes and everything that you guys are building? This is where I feel like my growth background comes in the most handy. Um, I think that the smartest way to grow is not, um, it's, it's like, let's just say that this is the pie right now, right? Like these are the people that know about D gods. It, a lot of people have this conception that you want to go from here to like m catapult moonshotting to like everybody. Right. But that is, I think not the right way to grow and definitely not the way that I want to grow because I think that we're making, I think we're making two really, really strong brands here with D gods and Utes, And, um, I think that we want to grow organically and, 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 and every step of the way um, know why we're growing. And this is why I, I tweet about this pretty often. The worst thing that can happen is in life, honestly, is, is being a one hit wonder. Because what happens is like you don't know what drove that growth or you don't know why you ended up getting that hit or why you made that hit. And so now you're held to these insane expectations, but you don't know what drove that process. And then you can't replicate it. For me, I feel like we never really had it too easy at any given point. And so I feel like we do know why we've grown at each of these steps. So the way I see it is this is our pie right now. I just want to hit the people that are right outside the pie and then make something that's, uh, you know, let's just say it's awareness. Then you have, it's like awareness, consideration. So that people find out or they see impressions of, you know, on social media. And then consideration is them going to the website, them going to blur, checking it out. And then conversion is like when they, you know, hit the buy button and they're in and then we want to activate them. And how do we give them a great onboarding experience? Um, and then we want to retain them. And then from there, you know, they will refer new people in because uh, they're going to refer new people in because they like the experience so much. They'll talk about it and create good word of mouth. So if you think about it, you know, awareness, that's us going viral on Twitter. Um, and then what you get from going viral is a new crop of people. But it's not people that are fucking all the way in Idaho. It's people that are the friends of the friends. It's just a network right outside. So I, I categorize it as people that are in NFTs and there's people in crypto and there's people that are crypto curious. And then there's people that are like NFT curious and you know, you can continue to expand from there. And so I think about if I'm giving out our secret sauce right now, I'm a pretty numbers driven guy come from a growth background. So it's social media awareness. That's like impressions on social media. It's like people finding out about us, word of mouth, whatever it is. And then it's like website. I think this is where we struggle a lot today and where I want to fix is how can we get people that find out about us that go to our website to easily find the part of our ecosystem they want to buy. So it's like you can either afford a D-God, a Bitcoin D-God. If not, then get a D-God. If not, then get a U. If not, then get, you know, uh, dust. And so it's like how can we make specific assets on all of the different points of conversion so that people can self-categorize and self-qualify? Um, potentially dropping a newsletter so people that might not be ready to buy today can get information and find out events near their area and then, uh, you know, eventually convert later on the process. And then you get to activation. Obviously, people saw what we launched on the metric side here with DID. And the idea was you buy DGOD, you onboard, and then you get followed by the, uh, you know, by the, by the Twitter accounts. It's a small thing, but it moved the metrics pretty fucking significantly. So it was like a little launch, pretty significant uptick there. And um, that's an example of kind of, building things that are data driven that hit back to one of these funnel points and then where i think points are going to be super huge once people find out what this is uh points are going to be the retention mechanism i think it's going to keep people really sticky get them to fucking delist be deeply deeply entrenched in the um ecosystem and feel like they're always getting rewarded um and then from there you know referral i think this happens pretty organically but i feel we can juice this as well so my goal in a lot of ways is how can i take this growth approach um, on a scientific systematic level and then apply it to something that's as kind of airy fairy as uh, NFTs. And my guess is if we can do this well, and I can basically do math from, this is the number of impressions that we get and this is the number of new buyers that we get and we have that down to a fucking science. Can you imagine what happens when we put rocket fuel on that? <laughs> like, you know, and, and so I think um, in a lot of ways that has been the more secret behind the scenes strategy that you know, people will see us roll things out and maybe people that are this deep into this podcast and listen to this part of this will understand the kind of method behind the madness. But um, my goal is to always hit one of these points is hit this part of the funnel at any given point and then build levers so that in 
five, six months from now, we've gotten growing an NFT project, both in revenue for our company in asset value and all these different things down to a fucking science. And uh, we can choose that pretty hard. Okay, so you mentioned a few times uh, points, and I know we can't dive into that yet. I know that's going to be a part two item. This is this is part one podcast. We're going to have part two where we deep dive everything. But right now, what can you tell me about season three? And then we'll get into Utes from there. Yeah, because I think I'm sure a lot of people are listening to this right now and thinking I'm just going to be talking about season three and, and Utes two a lot. And um, I think it's tough because I used to have this strategy where I would just like go on spaces, go on Twitter and just talk exactly about what we're going to do. Famously, I talked uh, a big book on like scholarships, which ended up being Ute list. Like I was talking about it the whole time, giving the exact mechanics. People didn't believe it until they saw it. Um, and I think now what's challenging is that when I share stuff about what we're working on, that's in progress. I think people, there's people that will go clip it, make a thread and then people will fucking see the thread and then they'll be like, Oh fuck, you know, is this happening? What happens in this fucking edge case scenario? And then they'll hound me for that answer 50 times. And in my mind, I'm like, Oh bro, we, that was like a fucking idea I threw out randomly. And I'm realizing that it's just hard to do that these days because people can potentially get misled or whatever. So I think, um, yeah, our new approach to this now is let, let's try to tell this story in a compelling way. And I think that people will really enjoy the rollout for everything that's coming up. And so I thought that this would podcast would be fun to do as kind of like a precursor because I think the last time that I've done one of these, uh, me internally and my own brain and the way I think about the world has shifted uh, hundreds of degrees. You know, it's a, it's a big difference. I think um, we, I'm not even necessarily proud of a lot of the stuff that we have out there on the fucking blockchain that's on our websites or on our Twitter. Like, I think that we've just advanced past that. And so much of what I'm excited about what's coming out over these next, uh, you know, in these next few weeks is it's just a new, a new approach on D gods, a new approach on Utes across the fucking board. And it's taking out all the bad shit and replacing it with things that we now think are fucking electric and interesting and, uh, ideally just breathing life into both D gods and Utes and dust and all these things, but also obviously like, I hope that it has an impact more broadly in the ecosystem and maybe brings life into what is now kind of like a, sp a spiraling ecosystem. So no pressure, but uh, yeah, I, I do think that uh, I feel pretty confident that the things that we're dropping right now are going to be worth talking about um, and exciting to discuss. And, and just like everything that people think are little issues or whatever it is, I think we've scoped I mean, you've seen it. I think we scope like fucking everything, you know, and, and um, I think I, I just want the work to speak for itself. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So, okay, so getting into from there, you know, we, we talked about Utes, and uh, like we mentioned that we we're going to talk about Utes. So let's talk about Utes. I think there's a lot of people who are obviously Ute holders right now that are like, hey, what? When us, like when, you know, when are we going to get things that are specifically made for us? Like when are we going to be kind of the major focus? So talk to me about if I'm a Ute holder right now, why should I be excited about the future? What, you know, when is season two or Utes two coming? Um, is Utopia a lie? Fill me in. What, what's going on? Yeah. Let's talk about Utopia being a lie. Cause I think it's, <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. Uh, to me, I think it's a no brainer that Utes probably has one of the more interesting, if not like the most diverse and uh, talented communities in all of Web3. I think the artwork, like, man, I'm just, I've never been more proud of something that we've made than the fucking Utes artwork in a lot of ways. And I think there's a lot of potential within that community, but I think that there are structural things that need to shift and uh, change with the project. And there's some stuff I just can't talk about right now. But I think that all the major concerns with Utes are going to be addressed in a big way. And I, I think that when people look back and they think about this time period with Utes um, being kind of like so uh, orphaned or not thought about or not talked about, um, my, my thinking is I feel like the time is coming very soon where even if I like, you know, even if certain people like D-Gods or think about D-Gods more or talk about them more now, I just think that the the groundswell that Utes is ready to create is uh, disgusting. And it's one of those things that I, I wish that things played out differently, if I'm being honest, in certain aspects. But you can't change the past. What I do know is that there is something very special about that project and about the community. And uh, we have every intention of uh, 
<laughs> doing justice to that fucking project and, and giving it the light that it deserves. And and the best way to put it is maybe people just need to see me, you know, in my face saying it um, because I tweet it all the time. But very earnestly, our goal is the gods number one, like Utes number two in the most literal sense, like uh, across the board, like on any blockchain. And so, um, yeah, man, I, I think that we have very ambitious goals with Utes. I think there's constraints today that we're going to fix. Let's uh let's talk about that sweatshirt real quick. When when's that dropping? I need that. Oh, there's gonna be a big uh big drop with uh, some of the black all black blacked out hoodies. So I'm pretty excited for that. I'm gonna need one of those. Yeah, you walked so in fun. and I was like, I mean, we just we didn't have a small <laughs> laying there for me. I mean, come on now. <laughs> oh, these are sick. That yeah. that hoodie is the most fire hoodie. That's it's that low key. That's that with wealth, bro. That's that Riz, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm. A, I might have to come over to the house and, and just start opening boxes till I find that one. So, yeah. uh, but uh, but okay. So, is there gonna be specific utility down the road for Utes? Where? Because I get. I think like the the question that they always have is like, well, why should somebody? If if there's all these like different things for D gods and stuff like that, obviously not everybody can afford a D god, and I know right now Utes are at a at a lower price point. Um, but are there going to be things down the road where a D God holder might say to themselves, like, I, I want a U cause like, I want that utility and I'm not going to get that by having a D God. Absolutely. Unequivocally. Yes. Of course. Yes. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Okay. It's like, if we wanted to do baby D gods, we would have done baby D gods, but obviously like Utes as a brand has a much different uh appeal and reach an audience that it's going to grow into and d gods has its own brand and what you'll see with season three is us taking that even further and kind of distinguishing them even further and um it's one of those things that i think is going to end up being uh one of the best moves that we've made is one not diluting the d gods like literally you know but the thing that's crazy to me about season three is there's about to be forty thousand nfts um attached to 10,000 NFT, you know, 40,000 JPEGs attached to 10,000 NFTs. So I'm glad we didn't dilute it. But I think that our ability to have such a different kind of audience as both these brands scale out with the gods and youth is going to be, it's going to be looked back on as like, damn, they really did that. Like, damn, it was just sitting there at fucking whatever, 1.5 ETH for so long. It's crazy. So I'm, I'm excited, man. I think you two are fucking sleeping giant is the term I always say. I'm right there with you. Hey, I got more. I got more Utes than I got D God. So I am. Yeah. I am definitely super excited. I want that hoodie, and uh, I might have to uh, fight you before we leave here on on grabbing that. But um, what is what has been the biggest challenge that you faced with Utes since launch? Well, earlier in this pod, I told the story of kind of like the nonstop nature of this uh, project, whether it feels like that to the public or not. And so I do think that the challenge with the Utes has just been like. Every single time that I feel like we've gotten our handle on things, the market just shifts 180 degrees. And so where we had all these plans for Utes at the beginning, this is why we're going with the, the phrase Utopia was a lie, because I think it's very interesting. Um, we the, the goal for Utopia was to have this application process and the Ute list, and we're going to have the most elite community, you had all these celebrities and cool influencers, all these people coming in. And what ended up happening? It's like a lot of those people fucking sold and they're out. And the D gods are still in and like, you know, you have this kind of, you have this fringe community that's starting, which I think is the best thing that could possibly fucking happen for you. It's because in a lot of ways, the magic for D gods is you had this kind of like a culmination of all of these different types of characters and this diverse group that got together. And that's why that community is so strong. And I think that this period of time that Utes is going to go through and has been going through it, when, when they start to run, it's going to be like, they're, the most diamond dick community of all time what and, and i've seen it happen already with uh d gods and obviously utes now on a longer time horizon but um that is where i think utes are going to really really shine and i think this utopia was a lie will play into utes too in a big way of just the commentary of this is what we thought it would be and we did everything the right way or whatever and there are all these like equal rarity everything's perfect whatever it is but like reality's not perfect Utopia was a fucking lie and it's dark. Like the reality is fucking dark. And I think exploring that both on a mechanics level, when you play in and think about what makes you unique, it's this equal rarity. And that gives us a lot more leeway to play around with what we do on the next kind of mechanical 
game mechanic masterpiece like after season three um so i think that's going to be exciting and i think that um yeah man i, I think that i think a lot of people like utes and there's certain things that stop them from buying it today and i think those things are going to be fixed and once those are fixed i think off to the fucking races off to the fucking races yeah. so Okay, so one thing I want to dive back into with uh, with season three is obviously anytime you launch something, there's always the chance that you don't, uh, you know, match or exceed expectations, right? And I think when something's been talked about for so long, the biggest you know dilemma there is what if what if we launch something and people don't give a shit? You know, what if it's not as exciting as as you know they as we think it's going to be, right? So. What are your thoughts on how do you make sure that you, you know, do match or exceed everybody's expectations? And how does that affect the way that you think about like dropping things and the timing of dropping things and all of that kind of stuff? Um, you know, talk to me about that. One, um, I, I do think we are going to blow people's minds. Um, that being said, when we've had moments where we fuck up or something doesn't go right or whatever it is at this point, that's like, like it's, it's like water under the fucking bridge in my mind because the follow through for us is always where magic happens, right? Like we've had some pretty pu public fuck ups, but I'm just not the kind of founder that's going quietly into the fucking night. Like, okay, we'll come back in 10 months and come fix it or whatever. It's like, bro, I'm on every space. I'm tweeting we're hitting the fucking lab. We're going to fix that shit immediately. Um, and if we don't fix it immediately, then we're going to give you a very good explanation for why we did the thing that we did or whatever it is. And so I get less worried about not delivering because my thing is we just know how to fix it. We know how to manage our guys and we know how to manage our community and, and uh, make sure that whatever we're going to launch, one, we understand them. We listen. We're participating in the conversation every day. So I think our understanding of what drives and makes this community tick is, is pretty deep. Um, but also, yeah, it's like people, like people that are worried that something that happened to another project is going to happen to us. I just don't think get it. And they will. And they, because, you know, you've been in the D guys community for a while and maybe this is, maybe this comes off as overconfident to people, but it's not that it's more just like people make mistakes and, when you make a mistake, there is an appropriate way to apologize and to come correct with the solution. And my thing is, we just know how to do that. Like, I've had to make enough apologies. I've had to correct enough fucking things that, uh, yeah, I think that that, that follow through is like second nature to me. So I'm actually just not worried about us um, fucking up or, or nuking. The thing that I do want to make sure is that we blow people's minds. Because I think that's what makes waiting worth it is if it's just like crazy, you're like, there's no fucking way these guys are doing this. Like, no way, bro. And then it's like, then to three days later, it's like, oh, fuck, there's no way they're doing that. And um, that's the that's the magic that we're trying to create here. Um, and that's what I think we have sitting in our fucking back pocket right now. Um, we just got to get it to the finish line. And that's coming up pretty soon. So. In that way, I definitely maybe come off here as confident or overconfident or whatever it is, but it's just because we put in the fucking work, man. We're just like show up every day. We're working really hard. We're being honest with ourselves when something sucks. And then when something's great, we're also honest with ourselves. And I'm just at a point where I feel like maybe there's details that need to be ironed out on all these different things we're launching and the details matter in this space. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think we're doing the right work. Everything we're doing is not designed for our personal benefit. It's designed for the benefit of the communities to a deep degree and on top of that it's also like fucking interesting creative worth talking about and just kind of mind-blowing so so with that then how do you decide when to launch because i because i know you and like if i said to you okay frank you can wait to drop season three till december <laughs> it would be even like it would be even crazier, but then you also... So many people in the community are like, shut the fuck yeah, up, yeah. Mark. <laughs> but, but, uh, but the floor price of D-Gods at that point might be three ETH at that point because people would be so, so angry that they got to wait until December, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess, when do you decide, okay, let's just pull the trigger? Like, because there's always kind of that pressure of like, we could just keep, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we could just keep iterating. That's the word I'm looking for. We could just keep iterating over this design over and over and over again and keep making it better and better and better. So when do you decide, okay, you know, now is the time to pull the trigger, drop season three and, you know, and let the chips fall as they may. 
when all the stars align, and it feels like those stars are aligning right now, and so we're going to drop it on August 9th. <laughs> oh, we're dropping the date right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. there we go. August 9th. That's the fucking day. I mean, we'll probably tweet it before. I mean, we'll tweet it when this thing goes out, so maybe people will skip to the end, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's the date. August 9th. Yeah. And and you, you, and you, you told you me know, before. I'm we, on the couch. It's the fucking Mark Colter podcast. No, we just got to do it. I mean, and you told me before we started the podcast that like. And that way, if anything goes wrong, we just blame Mark. No, no. This well, is actually the fucking move. But the thing, God. The, yeah, the yeah. thing is, like, people didn't hear this part. It wasn't recorded yet. But, like, I mean, I had a secret camera that was going that you said that if you don't hit the August 9th date, you're going to actually help me to get to X+. plus. So you're going to give me eight D-Gods, which is so kind. Well, if I don't hit the August 9th date, maybe <laughs> D-Gods crash so much that, <laughs> that I can afford just get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there no, we it's go. It's going to be sick. It's going to be sick. It's going to kick 9th. off 9th, yeah. August 9th. Let's go. Let's fucking go. Let's go. Yeah. Okay, so here's where I want to go from here. The The business model with D-Gods and Dust Labs and D-Labs and everything like that has changed over time. Um, obviously the whole NFT space and everything has changed over time. So walk me through like uh, from your approach, how have things changed and like, where do you see things going from here? Yeah, this is one of the things that I think, um, people sleep on a lot or people just have a lot of strong opinions on this. And I respectfully disagree a lot of times. Um, I think that we have a track record of just making money in creative ways that don't involve like charging our you know, holders a lot of stuff or doing these crazy mints or whatever it is. And I think what you'll see with season three, especially is uh, I'm a big fan of Mr. Beast. And I think I, what I like so much about his model is it's very much uh, a confident approach at how to build a business where, hey, I'm going to make X number of dollars and I'm going to just take all the money that I make and then go reinvest it into my next video, my next video, my next video. And I feel like a lot of people, when they're looking at NFTs, they're like, huh, how can I evaluate the fucking cash flows for 20 years or in a, in a business that's changed a million times in the last fucking year or two? And so where I might come off as a California frat bro douche or whatever it is, in my mind, I just think that people are overthinking it sometimes. And I think that as long as you deliver strong value, there's always creative ways to make money. And so what people will see with season three is, we're very good at making money when we want to, but we don't always want to. And a lot of times when we do, I'd much rather just pass it back to the fucking community in a creative way. And so that's all I'm going to say right now um, with, with the new approach towards the business model. But I think that if you are trying to ascribe a specific repeatable cash flow business uh, model to NFTs today, I think you're just missing the point in a lot of ways. And um, my response to a lot of people that are trying to evaluate NFTs in, in a very strict fucking, you know, finance bro heavy way is that that approach is going to end up meaning that you're limiting the upside and what you're able to create because you're boxing yourself into one type of way to make uh, make money for your business. And our approach has always just been keep a really low burn rate. You know, we just work out of a fucking house, not do anything fancy. You know, we're, we scaled back the team when we saw the market was turning for the worst. And uh, we just have a very conservative approach. You know, I think we bought like an $800 hot tub and like a $200 ice bath. And that's been like 100%, 200% increase in productivity. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, you know, we, we started this fucking project uh, in a shitty apartment in West Hollywood. And now we live in like a less shitty uh, like a less shitty living situation, but it's pretty much the same energy at this point, um, to this day. And I think keeping a low burn is what allows us to feel so confident in going periods where we're not like trying to max monetize or max juice, um, our community or, or what we're building here. But I think we will monetize in continually creative ways, but me and Kevin agree on this the most where I think there's a simple way to think about a great product. A great product is something that both the seller of the product makes money on selling and the person that's buying it feels like they're getting more than their money's worth on the product. And I think that most people that buy into our community and into our projects feel that way to a certain degree. And I think we can get better in a lot of ways. And that's my goal. Um, even though they're not even buying the fucking product from us, which is what is kind of twisted about the, the business models. Like when someone new buys it, you got it, whatever price line, we're making that money, but it's fine. I think we can get creative in ways to solve around that problem. 
So I think what you'll see and what you can expect from us is just a continual creative way to build out business models that make sense for what we're doing and uh, solidifying the ones that work and quickly scrapping the ones that don't. Um, and so that's my take on, on how to build a business model in this space. But it's not for everyone. It kind of requires a younger like brain that doesn't have family and kids and just can like work on this 24 seven and like, you know, like I'm not too stressed about my pay or whatever it is. Like a lot of the co-founders feel this way because we think we're building something really valuable for the long term. And, you know, I don't mind just fucking working all day and just doing that to do it because that's just the default. Um, and I think the long term incentives are deeply aligned. Uh, so, yeah, it doesn't really matter in the short term as much. I think as long as we keep a low burn, I'm proud to say we're profitable on both entities, D, D Labs and, and Dust Labs. And if we're profitable, it means we have a fucking infinite runway and then nobody should be complaining or upset at uh, how we make money. And so, I, yeah, I find it fucking hilarious. All the keyboard warriors on Twitter talking about this topic specifically because I'd be shocked to see other projects that or any other companies in this space that have been as creative in the ways that you know we finance and, and make sure that we don't drain our fucking holders of liquidity and when we do charge something we want to give that value back and i feel pretty proud of the way we've done it so far and i feel like we're just going to continue down that because that's just our culture that's just how we do it so i have two more questions to go and then we'll and then we'll wrap up so my second to last question is you know, there's always those times where there's kind of the lulls where you guys are working, you're kind of, you're not even tweeting at the time and, you know, and, and community members are kind of sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Right. And they're, you know, when's this coming? When's announcement? When, you know, the moment you tweet about anything, you know, you could tweet about an album coming out or whatever. Someone's like, yo, there's an announcement coming. So for, so during those times when the next time there's one of these lulls, cause they're going, it's going to happen. What do you want people to know about? you know, what's happening behind the scenes? What do you want them to, to realize is happening behind the scenes when there is one of these periods of time where you're not bull tweeting and everything along those lines? I'll challenge the question. And what I'll say is that I think my goal is for that to not happen. Like, I, I don't think these lows should happen. Like, I think we should have a better engine for our content. We should have a better engine for releasing things and launching things. And that is where I'm the most excited about what's coming out pretty, pretty fucking soon now is I think we're just setting up the framework for us to create and launch things at a much faster cadence and just dominate not just the timeline of users today, but start penetrating new audiences in smart and clever ways and having a steady state on that continuing to grow and take upward. So I think that the lulls are a problem and I don't want there to be lulls. I actually want there to be a steady state of things that are constantly coming out that are increasingly exciting. Um, but I think that the thing that limited us from doing that before was the lack of clarity around the vision, to be totally honest. Like I think early days with the gods up until I'd say maybe three, four months ago, we had a lot of different ideas of where this thing could go in the future. And part of that just came from a humbleness and an honesty to ourselves that, hey, we don't really know where the space is going to go. And so let's not pigeonhole ourselves and box ourselves into one specific path. But I think those days are numbered. And I think that we feel pretty confident about our interpretation of what the future will hold. Like I'll say it in the best way to summarize it is I think that everybody to a degree in the future is going to be owning or holding or buying like digital goods of some type or format. And this trend will only continue to increase. And my goal is for what we're building here at D Labs and Dust Labs is we want to make the best ones. <laughs> yeah, everyone's going to own digital collectibles and everyone's going to buy them and own them in some way. Um, I think our goal is we're pretty early movers on this and, and one of the biggest companies in the space at this point in this, in this domain. And I just see a lane for us to strategically keep making the right moves over not just the six month period, but a one to five year period to a 10 year period. Where I think we can keep doing interesting things in the short term, but all of those things be targeted towards this end state of uh, being the biggest and, and uh, you know, most premium fucking uh, digital collectible creators in the world, digital goods, digital assets. And I think there's a specific science to it that we're on the cutting edge of, and it's an interesting different paradigm. And that's where I think my focus is on. And I think not having that vision early days made it a lot more challenging to land on what the next move would be or the next move would be. But now I feel, I feel like we have the next six months 
you know, in our back pocket. Like, I think we know what we want to do for the, the next six months. And then I think from there, the only reason we were able to get to that is because now I know where we want to be in a year. And that's, I think, to the community where I think, you know, you've watched me kind of grow up <laughs> in front of you guys from going from like Frank is typing in the Discord and the pre-sale to obviously um, rock bottom and making a promise to the community that we'd <laughs> go to number one on Soul. And now I'm here with the promise that we're going to go to number one on ETH. I think we're about to run it back. Um, yeah, you see me kind of grow up and this team grow up in front of your eyes. And I think that in a lot of ways, um, man, we're just getting fucking started. I think that now we feel confident. We feel like we know what we're doing. We know the levers to pull. We understand where we fit in this ecosystem today. But I also think we have a really unique insight on what success is going to look like, not just now, but what the projects of the future are going to look like and how we can be ahead of them and, and doing things that are exciting. And I think what you're experiencing right now is this transition period from us kind of figuring out our footing to us having a very confident thesis and vision. And part of my goal with what's coming out over these next few weeks is crystallizing what that is so that when you're asking yourself, like, why did I spend so much on this fucking JPEG? It's like, oh, no, this is exactly what it is today, but this is where they want to take it. And I don't want to do it injustice by talking about it right now in this pod, because I think we've created a lot of assets and we've created a lot of, uh, you know, branding and, and design and videos and all of this stuff and mechanics that help explain and show people exactly what we want to go make and where we're at today. And I just feel confident on this vision. And I think we've battle tested it in our own brains on chat GPT on in every different angle. And I think when you game theoretically play out what the best scenario, um, you know, to be in, in a year from now and, and five years from now and 10 years from now, I think that we have a pretty confident thesis on where this space is going to go. And at this point, and I think we're going to make the right moves to be on top of it every single time. So I think we're just in a, entering a different era of this com this company and this project and these are like the last few weeks of the old style of doing things and where i think we want to go is the new style of uh constantly just things happening and and the, the puzzle pieces coming together in, in front of people's eyes in a compelling way because i think we're onto something pretty special here and i always say this man there's just <laughs> like i'll just never forget the fucking visual of being in that shitty apartment and seeing the D God's domains on Namecheap available for fucking five bucks. Um, and yeah, I, I saw it back then and it felt like there was something special. And, and I just feel like, yeah, now we're starting to realize some of that. But it's just it's just getting started, man. I was going to ask you for like parting thoughts, but like that was beautiful. <laughs> I think my parting thoughts are. I. I. I think that so much of the goal for the last maybe six months and then even before that for the last year and a half was this idea of like number one. Um, and I like it because it's fun and I'm competitive and like it's like nice. You can measure on a fucking chart and all this stuff. But I think now as it's gotten closer than I think most people that have been here for a while uh, could ever possibly imagine. I think now it's gotten closer. I think people need to start waking up and realizing like it's not even about just number one it's about what comes after that and i think that we're where you're what you're about to see over these next few weeks you're not going to see me marketing and talking about number one you're going to see me talking about how big i think this thing can get and where what i think the groundwork for what we've created today can lead to and that i think is where our community needs to rally around and be excited about is hey like number one's going to be sick don't get me wrong i mean that's going to be a fucking you know dope day you're gonna listen to a bunch of playboy cardi that day whatever it is um obviously that's happening yeah we'll see we'll see how how it shakes out whenever it happens um but i think it's not even about that at this point it's really about hey guys there's something fucking special about the you guys and utes and i think we're on the on the cutting edge of a space that is going to get a lot bigger when more sophisticated and participants start to enter and it's going to look very different from what it looks like today and uh i just want you guys to know that we're staying on top of it and i think we want to start setting some fucking trends and and start talking about and, and launching things that reflect our vision of what an nft can be and our vision of what this community can be and not try to follow what any of the fucking predecessors of this this shit you know did before us like i think we have a very clear crystal 
vision that is practical, grounded in reality about where we think the space can go. And I think we have the right team assembled to, to, to handle that opportunity. And um, yeah, I think, you know, I think that I'm just deeply fucking grateful uh, for everybody that's in this project and, and that supports the cause and supports what we're trying to do. And where I feel we can help the most is bring some clarity to what that is. And, and um, yeah, man, the, <laughs> it feels like, fuck, it's been going on for so long. Season three, huge two, all these things start to lose meaning, but behind the scenes and just behind those words is a lot of work and a lot of things that were scrapped and a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts that you're going to see start to play out over these next few months, um, next few weeks and ideally next few years. So pretty fucking excited. August 9th, August 9th. Let's fucking go. Let's fucking go. Let's go. All right, man, that was epic. So mind you guys, if you're listening to this and you have questions that you're like, Mark, why didn't you ask this? Remember, we're going to have part two. So tweet them at me. You can uh, don't tweet them at Frank. Tweet them at me. His, you know, his notifications already go crazy enough. Tweet them at me. I'll be making a list. We'll be running it back very soon. We got some exciting shit on the horizon. August 9th or I join X plus. So it's exciting for me regardless. <laughs> and uh, but Frank, dude, I appreciate you uh, coming out here tonight. And uh, for everybody else, we're finishing this up at. 12 14 so we just hit past midnight i gotta go and edit this thing and put this thing out so um hey man appreciate you coming on appreciate everybody tuning in and uh part two coming soon and august 9th let's fucking go let's fucking go see you guys peace